May I ask you to take your seats so that we can start the discussions. It is a very big room and there are not that many people in the room, so I would encourage you to move closer to the stage to create a more intimate feeling for the discussions. My name is Marcus Kummer. I'm Vice President with Responsibility for Public Policy at the Internet Society, and I'm also the Interim Chair of the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group who prepared the program for this meeting. We have a very distinguished panel to discuss the role of governments in multi-stakeholder cooperation and the overarching title is Building Bridges. The idea to this title came after last December's conference, World Conference on International Telecommunication in Dubai, which was rather acrimonious meeting and there was a generally felt need to get together to build bridges, to talk to people, to reach out to other people who didn't share necessarily the same opinions. And uh, one of the issues that has been with us since the World Summit on the Information Society is the role of governments in multi-stakeholder cooperation. Uh, before we go into the discussion proper, let me also make some more technical announcements. Uh, we have interpretation in all six languages, and the headphones uh, for uh, interpretation are uh, outside this room, so if you want to be prepared, if people, and people are encouraged to use their native language or the languages in English, we have interpreters here, but you will need headphones to listen to the interpretation, and they're available outside this room. I would also encourage you to uh, tweet uh, as you can as we go along. The hashtag is IGF2013. And uh, nowadays, if you're not tweetable, you don't exist, as we discussed when we prepared this session. So please do. We also encourage remote participation. We have a remote moderator, and we hope to bring in remote um, uh, participants as often as possible. To uh, shape the discussions, we uh, issued a call for public policy questions. This was a recommendation that came out of a working group for under the auspices of the Commission for Science and Technology for Development, the CSTD. They recommended that the IGF feed session should focus on two or three policy questions. So we received uh, input and we will put them up on the screen at one point. I don't know yet whether the, this uh, is ready. Uh, and uh, also, we uh, prepared some paper, sheets of paper where you can write down a question you may have, and we have our room helpers who will distribute uh, the sheets. So if anybody wants to write down a question, they can pass them on to our room moderators sitting in the front, uh, Jeanette Hoffman and Matthew Shears. They will try to moderate the room and group the question if they receive them in advance. But you can also ask for the floor more spontaneously. Having said all that, I will now introduce uh, the panelists. And I start with my, um, to my right. We have a minister from the UK. He is here with us, Ed Vasey. And to the right of him, Ambassador Fon uh, Benedicto Fonseca Filiu from Brazil. And to my left, we have Ambassador 
Danny Sepulveda from the United States, and to his left, Virat Bhatia from AT&T in India, and next to him we have the chairman of the Internet Engineering Task Force, Yari Arko, and on the very left, civil society representative, independent consultant, Avri Doria. Uh, with that, I would invite uh, Minister Vesey to give us his vision of the role of governments in multi-stakeholder cooperation. Please, Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Yesterday I spoke uh, from the podium, but today I'll speak from the panel in order to maintain the huge informality of this session. And I hope that uh, people will feel uh, free to participate, ask questions, heckle, boo, cheer, Stand up and applaud when you feel it's appropriate. Um, we are very pleased that the Government of Brazil uh, are leading this important discussion at the IGF, and uh, I'm very grateful that uh, I've been invited to participate in this panel because it gives me an opportunity to put forward the UK Government's perspective. We were very interested when Brazil proposed a formal ITU opinion on the role of governments at the World Telecommunications Policy Forum in Geneva in May, and it provoked us. We sat back and thought, well, what is the role of government? We'd never really sat down and uh, articulated it. So this is a great opportunity to do so, and it's a great opportunity at this panel discussion to hear what other people's uh, views are. Uh, in one sense, it's almost indefinable because the role of government is so uh, wide. And as the minister in the UK government responsible for Internet policy, as it were, I'm very well aware that uh, at almost every level, uh, Internet policy affects uh, all other ministers in the government, whether it's uh, health or education, home office, uh, security, foreign policy, uh, and so on. So uh, one always potentially runs the risk of uh, being too amorphous. But I think um, when you drill down as to where government plays an important role. We've come up with four themes which I hope might help shape the ensuing discussions. Uh, I think the first theme would be obviously to support the building of infrastructure. Uh, in the UK, uh, we are lucky that we have a very competitive telecoms marketplace. So the infrastructure has been built by the private sector, uh, both fiber built by BT and Virgin, but also for mobile operators now busily building out a 4G network. But the competition uh, framework that we've put in place means that this infrastructure is also accessible to most consumers because prices are low and the services they receive are very advanced. But government has intervened directly to support the build-out of networks to places which are not economic, rural areas. So we are putting north of a billion pounds into supporting the build-out of infrastructure. Uh, and again, although the majority of infrastructure is paid for by the private sector, I would emphasize that government sits behind that by providing the regulatory framework to ensure competition and fair pricing. Then I think government, the second point is that government has uh, a role, as it were, to make sure that the domestic le legal framework is fair and consistent. There are many clichés that uh, surround the debate on the Internet, and most of them are clichés because they're true. Uh, and one is that what is illegal offline is also illegal online. There's no peculiar exemption if an activity takes place on the Internet that means it should somehow be allowed if it's not allowed uh, in the physical world. But there are also roles for government to update uh, frameworks where uh, a legal issue is peculiar to the internet. For example, electronic uh, signatures might be a good example of that. And we, uh, we also intervene uh, on particular issues where the internet has perhaps exacerbated uh, an issue. So the infringement of intellectual property rights, for example, uh, we passed legislation uh, to allow rights holders to warn people if they were infringing intellectual property. Uh, we work with the Internet Watch Foundation 
to combat the prevalence of child abuse images and we work with internet service providers to provide parents with uh, suitable controls to protect their children from inappropriate content. But again, it's important to emphasize that we work in partnership with the private sector and with civil society because we find that is the most effective way to get things done. Top-down legislation can often be behind the curve, unwieldy, bureaucratic, and if you want an effective result, uh, then it's important to work in partnership. I would also emphasize a, a key principle here, which is that government intervention is not the same as government control. Government can act as a broker, as a representative of its citizens, and it can intervene in issues that are causing great concern. But that is not the same as controlling the Internet. And I think that leads on to my third point, and it won't surprise you that the UK uh, is a strong advocate of the rights of freedom of expression. And I think it's important, therefore, that government plays a role in defending free expression on the Internet, defending cultural diversity, defending gender equality, uh, and also helping its citizens to engage with the Internet by providing them with the opportunities for education and skills that they need to uh, gain access to the Internet. The Internet, as we all know, is a massive force for good, but there are uh, also uh, dangers. And again, government finds it, in the UK, we find it very effective to work with civil society, uh, particularly with children at school, to give them the opportunity to ask questions and to learn effectively how to use the Internet and to use the Internet safely. And that, again is an uh, important role for government. And then finally, it won't surprise you to learn that our fourth principle would be that government can help to support the multi-stakeholder process and partnership uh, working that I think has been at the root of the success of the Internet over the last two decades. We do this by writing checks, by providing financial support for key groups, uh, but also supporting the IGF process. We were the first to set up our own domestic uh, IGF and by making sure that our presence is felt at important uh, events such as this. So I think, uh, Chairman, if I could sum up, government, of course, has a role, but I hope that I've shown that throughout all of this, government has a role as a partner, uh, not as a uh, someone that dictates how the internet develops. So we partner with the private sector to build out infrastructure and we provide funding where the economics don't stack up and we provide the regulatory framework to ensure that that infrastructure is competitive so that consumers benefit from low prices. We partner uh, with the private sector and civil society on key issues such as the infringement of intellectual property, the protection of our kids online combating child abuse images, but we also emphasize the point that our legal domestic framework applies to the online world as much as it applies to the offline world. We support strongly freedom of expression on the internet and we are active participants and supporters of the multi-stakeholder framework which we think is essential to the continued success of the internet. Thank you for not heckling. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Uh, now, before I turn to Ambassador Fonseca Filiu, uh, for those who were not at the World Telecom Policy Forum in May, organized by the ITU, there was one so-called draft opinion. This is the equivalent of a resolution, more or less, which is the outcome of the WTPF. Brazil put forward on the role of governments. The first draft uh, was, I would say, uh, criticized, or there were many proposals for change, but the Brazilian delegation overnight went back to their hotel room and redrafted it and came forward with a revised opinion that I think many would agree with me would have been agreed by the meeting had there been more time, but basically we ran out of time. And the Secretary General of the ITU said, well, this opinion can now be taken elsewhere, and he explicitly mentioned 
this meeting here, the IGF meeting, and that was then when we had a meeting shortly thereafter to finalize the program. We thought, why don't we take this to the IGF? And here we are now, and over to you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank you for this introduction. Uh, you have uh, rightly pointed to the fact that the uh, draft opinion that emerged from uh, WTPF uh, was uh, the result of extensive consultations we held with uh, uh, different parties, both governments and representatives from other stakeholders that attended the meeting. And uh, in doing so, we tried to focus on the core uh, ideas we wanted to convey through this uh, draft opinion. And the core ideas are that uh, in recognition of the role and responsibilities government have in the mood stakeholder model, in the mood stakeholder pact, if we could maybe use that expression, uh, we should devise ways through which this role should be uh, operationalized to its full extent. So we are not aiming at expanding the government role and responsibility to the expense of other stakeholders. Rather, we are uh, recognizing the, 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 the fact that there are different responsibilities and try to devise ways through which that could be uh, enhanced. And this came out of the realization that in the context of internet governance uh, discussions, there is very scarce participation on the part of developing countries' representatives, uh, insufficient representation. Uh, I would say not only on the part of governments, but also other uh, stakeholders from developing countries, and particularly from the least developed countries. So this was an attempt to address this situation. Of course, as government, we are proposing uh, from the angle of government, uh, how that could be further enhanced and further operationalize the, uh, the participation of governments. But a point that was also made by our delegation is that we view, and since Brazil embraces fully the multi-stakeholder approach, that we view legitimacy in engaging the same exercise in regard to other stakeholders. So it is legitimate and I would say necessary and urgent to uh, explore ways through which civil society participation can be further enhanced and particularly I would stress civil society representatives coming from developing countries would like to see more representation from those sectors. Private sector coming from other regions can also be further uh, stimulated to participate and uh, uh, benefit from the the structure we have from the, the processes we have and so on. So uh, this, uh, I think the Brazilian proposal has to be seen in that light. It is not exclusive to ITU uh, as well. We initiated it at ITU, but it was made clear that the discussion belonged uh, everywhere. We can discuss how to operationalize the role of government and other stakeholders uh, within any existing uh, institution that deals with internet. So we are very pleased that at the end we could come up with some core ideas uh, that this was an important notion that could be pursued. And I'd like just to refer briefly to some uh, provisions, the key provisions of what was named the, the Brazilian proposal on operationalizing the role of governments. So basically we uh, in view that uh, ITU and other international organizations uh, have uh, uh, legitimacy in the process and they can uh, and should, they should support uh, meaningful government participation. So this is also a recognition of the legitimacy of participation of ITU and other institutions uh, in this process. Uh, Marcus Kummer referred in the beginning to the WIC meeting in Dubai and we agree it was uh, led to very acrimonious uh, outcome. Uh, it is, and we were, Brazil tried to play uh, uh, an approaching role and uh, facilitator role as we always try to do 
uh, in the process uh, since we, uh, as is maybe widely recognized, we share characteristics that enable us to talk to different constitutions, different groups. So I, I would say we have maybe a, uh, with more facility we can engage into, let's say, a mediation exercise, and we try to do that to the benefit of the meeting. At the end, the outcome was not the one we looked for, but we were a bit uh, amazed by the realization that for some parties, even the mention that ITU should have a role in Internet governance was something that raised immediate concerns and uh, rejection. So we, we thought it is uh, some of part of the consensus that emerged from the Tunis agenda should be reaffirmed. The legitimacy of participation of all stakeholders, including international organizations, but also governments, because the same rejection that applies to international organizations to some extent also applies to governments. So uh, this was, uh, let's say, in the origin of the, the proposal. And then we recognized that those organizations can provide meaningful, should assist governments in meaningful participation, but we, at the same time, we reinforce the notion that multi-stakeholder governance of Internet must continue to involve all parties, each in their respective roles and responsibilities. And to that end, all stakeholders should continue to cooperate in good faith. Uh, the, the most, uh, let's say, operative part of the opinion uh, request the, invites the Secretary General to support through the ITU Secretariat capacity building of developing countries in particular least developed countries to exercise their rights and fulfill their responsibilities relating to international internet related public policy issues as per paragraph 35A of the Tunis agenda and to continue promoting openness and transparency in the decision making process within ITU. This is something I'd like to highlight that Brazil fully support that discussions within ITU on internet governance should be open and transparent and we are, uh, this is a point we make in, uh, in the context of ITU. Uh, I think this uh, is maybe the, the most important idea. I would like to say this is a living document. We came to the WTPF with a version of the document. It evolved. Uh, we have this present version. It is, I would say, uh, subject to continuous uh, improvements. For example, when we refer to the notion that ITU should contribute to capacity building in regard to uh, the exercise of uh, and the discussion of internet-related public policy issues, we should maybe uh, uh, also have the understanding that this should take place in the context of the areas in which ITU is mandated to operate uh, as, as per the Geneva Plan of Action and its own uh, functions. I don't envision, for example, ITU assisting developing countries in, in intellectual property or anything that would be, let's say, outside this clear scope of ITU. And that's why this discussion belongs uh, in, in other forums in which particular aspects of Internet governance are, are dealt uh, with. Uh, I'd like just very briefly to refer to the intervention just made by Minister Ed Vesey and to uh, acknowledge the proposal and to thank the UK for this proposal. I think the EU are viewing the issue from a different angle. We are viewing it from the necessity to provide capacity for uh, uh, the role to be operationalized and the UK proposal which we endorse 100 percent points to the, the outcome. Once governments are fully empowered, then what, what is the expected outcome? And I f we would fully concur that these are core uh, roles for government to play this f f facilitation role to provide for uh, the appropriate regulatory and legal framework and uh, to promote freedom of expression, to foster the multi-stakeholder model. So we fully agree. And again, this is uh, maybe a different way to see the kind of idea we wanted to, to convey through our uh, draft uh, opinion. 
And uh, I think maybe I should uh, stop here at this point. Uh, uh, thank you. And just as a very last point to indicate that one of the policy questions that were raised in the context of the uh, preparatory uh, preparation for this meeting uh, within MAG refers to the fact of how uh, participation of governments uh, relates to uh, what we call the self-regulatory uh, uh, bodies, such as IETF and others. And I think it's also a very important uh, point if we could uh, looking at ways how to operationalize the participation of governments to, to take into account that in some areas, like those that of self-regulatory agencies, uh, the governmental participation as such the, is not what is required in the first place, but government should be appraised and uh, incorporate also their views in the process. So I think this the question that was raised and I would quote, uh, there is a lot to do about governments trying to regulate the Internet through the ITU. A lot of work, however, currently takes place in self-regulatory bodies. Governments may not or sufficiently be aware of. An important question could be, how can governments be integrated in self-regulatory Internet bodies so that their concerns are heard and where possible, possibly mitigated? without impeding on the economic development and freedom of information flows. Who need to be brought into contact to establish this and where? So I think this is one element that should be clearly also in the picture as we look into ways through which the government as part of the mood stakeholder pact uh, could, could have their, uh, their roles and their responsibilities exercised, taking fully into account the fact that in some cases those self-regulatory bodies are there, they are doing very important uh, work and this should be acknowledged by governments uh, and also incorporated fully in, in their uh, proceedings uh, and not trying maybe to supersede or to compete or to overlap with something that is being done and very well done by, by self-regulatory bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and I think uh, the role Brazil played already at the WTPF really helped to build bridges between what were two camps in Dubai. The tone definitely at the WTPF was much more reconciliatory than a few months before. The policy questions, uh, Ambassador Fonseca, I feel you uh, mentioned, they are now up on the screen. You can also find them on the IGF uh, website, uh, and we will get back to them later. But I would agree that question number four is a very central question. Now, before I turn to Ambassador Sepulveda, I noticed that what I said to the beginning, that if you're not tweetable, you don't exist, has already been tweeted. But for copyright purposes, I have to give him the right. He mentioned that when we had our preparatory meeting. So over to you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the recognition. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you also for, for having me participate here. I appreciate the minister's comments and the ambassador's comments. I, I also welcome the participation of our friends from civil society industry and the technical community. And I look forward to having a two-way dialogue with in this very large room with our friends who are here as well. Um, I, I was actually at the WTPF in question and I'm intimately familiar with the Brazilian proposal uh, and the conversation that took place there and the conversation that has taken place since. I think I, I would like to take a step back and, and say a few things. Uh, I, it's perfectly understandable that governments have a very strong interest in having this conversation. The internet the network itself, the connection between networks, it was initiated as a private grand experiment uh, well over 30 years ago. And today it's a crucial part of the global economy of free expression and inclusive economic development. So again, naturally, our governments, any government, is going to want to have their people have access to what has become one of the most revolutionary and greatest communications tools of all time. And it has been governed historically under the multi-stakeholder system, which has been under a, uh, 
process of continuous improvement, I don't want to talk about this particular proposal by Brazil or this particular conversation as a proposal and a conversation that's taking place that is initiated in a vacuum. It is taking place as we have seen the multi-stakeholder system grow from what was originally really a very small community of technical experts and academics and uh, some research aspects of government to what is now actually a very large community and a very sophisticated system of multi-stakeholder institutions. And we've always worked to improve the transparency of the system and to ensure that it serves the needs of Internet users and their governments and that adapts to the increasingly dy dynamic world in which we live. Over the years, there have been various proposals to suggest that a single intergovernmental body should be enlisted to strengthen the role of governments in existing multi-stakeholder processes or overtake some of those processes. I want to note that the United States respects these ideas. We are members in good standing of the ITU and, and other organizations in which ideas like this have been raised. And we applaud the effort and thought put into these proposals and believe that it reflects a common aspiration uh, to ensure that the multi-stakeholder system includes all stakeholders and all stakeholders are treated equally. But that it is also true that the proposals we have seen to date, setting aside the current proposal that we're discussing uh, relative to, to Brazil, have, to, to our mind, often presented uh, a challenge in that they would do little to improve global access to the innovative and accessible internet and could even work against that goal if improperly implemented. So it is our point of view that we start from the premise that the multi-stakeholder system has proven itself more successful than any pre-existing model for the deployment and governance of a new technology. That is, it. that is not to say that it's perfect and its improvement is something that all stakeholders have sought from its inception. And we believe that the rising rate of stakeholder participation in the system, uh, for example, at the GAC, in which Brazil and other members of the developing world are active participants and very effective participants, that the rising rates of stakeholder participation in the system proves that the community, the community of stakeholders, has made ongoing and demonstrable improvements toward full inclusion. Ideally, as we move forward with this conversation, any suggestions for further improvement in the Internet governance systems would not just focus on any one institution or narrowly on the role of governments. If, if, that is not, if that is not handled carefully, by focusing on a single institution or by focusing on this one specific stakeholder, you could easily disadvantage other equally important stakeholders. And I take great comfort in, in the ambassador's uh, expression uh, of having this conversation not just at the ITU but in multiple fora with a focus on all stakeholders and ensuring that the, the vibrant civil society and industry communities of the developing world are encouraged to participate in the multi-stakeholder institutions just as much as the, the governments of the developing world. So we will continue to seek to expand that discussion beyond strengthening the hand of, of governments and internet, in internet institutions to ensuring that all stakeholders are paid their due respect and afforded a meaningful and equal opportunity to participate as we will hear from others and as we have heard yesterday, civil society, academia and others have also called for strengthening the rules and we must also address their concerns. We, the United States, fully acknowledge the need to find ways to better integrate governments and other stakeholders from the developing nations into the multi-stakeholder institutions that govern the Internet today. And more importantly, so do those institutions. We applaud Brazil's commitment to the multi-stakeholder governance at home and abroad, the CGI system that they use domestically to manage uh, to manage their Internet issues is a multi-stakeholder system. We offer our hand of friendship in a joint effort to expand the role of all stakeholders from the developing world in the multi-stakeholder process. And we would posit that while the ITU may be one of numerous entities that can assist in that effort, it may not be the best one in, to assist in that effort. I would also like to note, and separately, that uh, we have great ad admiration for the manner in which Brazil uh, pursued the construction of its pending Marco Civil legislation. Uh, it was originally drafted and introduced as a collaborative work. I went to Brazil and met with the bill's author, and he walked me through the transparent process that inclu included open and public debates on the construction of that text. 
Uh, and, and it produced a call for a free and open Internet in Brazil that the Brazilian government has embraced. Um, we do still have some outlying concerns with potential inclusion of localization requirements. But nonetheless, uh, the underlying text and the underlying intent of the Marcos Seville legislation and the effort that Brazil has made to incorporate its civil society and its industry and the construction of that legislation is an admirable one and, uh, and, and we want to commend that. Further, we've followed with great interest the recent news stories about the potential for an internet, an internet summit that would be held in Brazil in April 2014. And I want to take this opportunity with my counterpart, um, the ambassador from Brazil here, to reiterate that Brazil and the United States share a vision of the Internet that ensures freedom of expression, security, and respect for human rights. We also share an interest in strengthening the existing democratic governance structures with inputs from governments, civil society, and the private sector. And given these common principles and vision that the U.S. and Brazil share, I appreciate Brazil's leadership role on this issue, and we look forward to hearing more about what the summit itself will seek to achieve and if there's a way in which we can be of assistance. But as we approach the summit and as we continue this discussion going forward, please understand that the United States government strongly believes that the global community is best positioned to benefit from a vibrant and growing Internet environment where commercial, civil society, and government stakeholders jointly participate in the existing distributed set of Internet institutions, each performing specific tasks without unnecessary duplication or encroachment on the role of others. Again, we welcome this debate. We appreciate the opportunity to engage in, cooper in cooperation and collaboration on the challenges we face. And we hope we get, can get to a place where everyone, particularly our friends in the developing world, can fully engage the multi-stakeholder system, helping to bolster its accountability, inclusiveness, and responsiveness to the needs of the global community of Internet users. I hope we can think creatively in order to bring more developing country governments, along with their counterparts in civil society, academia, and industry to the table of our multi-stakeholder institutions. And I hope we can grow and evolve together. After all, that's the point of what's brought us here today. It's a common appreciation for the good that the Internet has enabled and can enable for those who are not yet connected, and an interest in the future of the Internet. So I look forward to working collaboratively with everyone at this table, and again, I very much appreciate the opportunity to share these thoughts. As we move forward in this conversation, if the audience would like to have a more detailed conversation about the text itself, we can do that. Um, and, and again, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. Thank you. I suggest we move down the table. Without further ado, Virat, would you be next? Thank you, Marcus. Excellencies, um, honorable minister, fellow panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, some remarkable points have been made already this morning by um, some very eminent panelists. Um, which strengthen the proposition that I seek your permission to make. Um, the concept of multi-stakeholderism, um, let me say at the outset as we see it from the private sector, includes the business and has the business playing a very vital role as a key stakeholder in the bottom-up, transparent, inclusive Internet governance-related decision-making processes. This is the essence of the Tunis agenda, and to interpret it in any other manner would be to do injustice to this fine document that has withered the test of time, notwithstanding the multiple and significant developments, several IGFs, including this eighth IGF being held in this beautiful city of Bali. Let me elaborate the rationale behind this submission. Close and informed partnership between the government and other multi-stakeholder groups is not only necessary but in fact the condition precedent to an enlightened internet governance approach, and that includes the four themes, uh, well, three of the four themes laid out by the Honorable Minister from UK. Governments often try to balance many competing priorities in their role to implement and enforce policies in national and public interest. However, in the internet world, somewhat different from the old traditional telecom world, the government is neither a big player itself in most cases, nor does it have years of accumulated technical 
and economic capacity to manage this peace on its own. This distinction is important between Internet and traditional telecommunications, and the Tunis agenda must be seen from the prism of this fine distinction, as should be the role of global multilaterals such as the ITU. The government is not always very close to the facts of the various stakeholders that the government represents, whether it's the private sector, the technical community, the civil society, and especially the youth. Sometimes a new policy initiative sounds like a tremendous and a simple idea, but in fact that policy can have chain reactions that can unintendedly disrupt other processes and assumptions and by consequence the work of other stakeholder groups. That's because policy could be based on a set of incomplete understanding of the current environment or simply a wrong set of assumptions. And therefore, ongoing engagement, not just consultation, but including, including the inputs provided by various stakeholders is crucial. So the government, with its tremendous responsibility on its shoulders, must move very carefully and deliberately with a well-informed understanding and an openness to consult, engage, and include the inputs from industry, technical communities, and civil society. It is precisely for these reasons why multi-stakeholder institutions are of such great value. They have mechanisms built in to ensure that the dialogue must happen. And in turn, this is the biggest risk that faces traditional multilateral institutions based on policy making, where only governments have a formal role. There is a risk in a multilateral fora and intergovernmental bodies whose importance is otherwise second to none that the essential consultative process and the process of including the inputs between the governments and other multi-stakeholder processes may not occur in a complete or a meaningful or a timely manner. Each one of those is important if the roles have to be performed in the manner that we expect them to be and be meaningful. This is particularly vital in the field such as Internet, where no doubt there are important government policy concerns, but also the actual management of infrastructure, network, devices, spectrum, and several other resources, as well as the whole concept of permissionless innovation is undertaken by a multiple set of stakeholders outside the government. Let me reference the WISIS for a moment. It is always clear from the WISIS that the issue is not government versus multi-stakeholder. That's a false distinction. It has always been each entity participating according to its mandate and expertise. Government and other stakeholder groups have different and complementary mandates and expertise. The day-to-day -day technical operations of Internet were never understood to be the mandate of the governments, but rather the mandate of Internet technical communities, which in most cases are also understood to be the private sector. However, it has always been understood that the governments have a key role in the development and implementation of policy, as was laid out by the Honorable Minister from UK. But the framework, including the legal framework, as I had submitted for your consideration, and in doing so, the government must rely on all members of the Internet community to develop the best and the most complete public policy. This point was underscored by the understanding that Internet governance is much broader than domain name systems, its value, culture, policy, technical operation that comprises the Internet. As such, an effective Internet ecosystem must rely on all parts of the society, the government, the private sector, and the civil society, according to their expertise and mandate. Let me close this comment by re-emphasizing that the multi-stakeholder governance is therefore a system by which all Internet ecosystem participants, including the government, in their mandate and expertise, work on an equal footing for the greater benefit for a stable and innovative Internet environment. I would, in addition, place an additional responsibility on the government, especially in cases where a strong culture for consultation and inclusion of views does not exist. That is precisely in these situations that the government should not only embrace multi-stakeholderism, which goes beyond consultation and into a meaningful engagement, but in fact act as a facilitator 
and a catalyst of multi-stakeholder, bottom-up, inclusive, transparent decision-making processes for Internet governance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. That was Virat Bhatia speaking and not Yari Arko. The scribes followed the uh, list of speakers we had circulated before. Uh, please make sure that for the archives you correct this and make sure that it was Virat Bhatia. We now turn to Yari Arko, the chairman of the ITF. Please, Yari. So I actually think <coughs> the, if, if the minutes show that that previous speech was from me, that, that would have been very good, very wise words. Thank you. Um, so th thank you, Marcus, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk, and many wise words have already been said. Um, and I'm sort of struggling a little bit to f um, figure out what, what to say in addition, um, but um, as a representative of the technical community, I uh, look at this from the angle of um, what kind of cooperation we need from, with the governments and uh, you know, from a very practical perspective. Um, and I wanted to raise three comments, basically. First, historically, the Internet technology was largely under the radar and there was little need for regulation, policies, or government involvement. Fast forward to 2013, the Internet is critical to all of our daily lives. Now we are finding in the technical community that there are areas where there's a need to discuss between the governments and, and ourselves. Um, the engineers at the ITF and elsewhere have realized that they cannot work on the technology alone in all cases and that things like emergency calls are something that we have to work on in the larger community. Standards in this area are, of course, safety critical. Uh, it's also very much a case for needing one standard for the whole world, as otherwise when I travel from Finland with my smart device here to Bali, um, it might not be able to do um, uh, emergency call here. Another example is technology for dynamic radio frequency allocation using something we call white space for wireless communications. The technical community is not in the business of deciding what frequencies are white space or setting the requirements on how static, static or dynamic allocation happens. Governments and intergovernmental bodies are. But the technical community is building the protocol components for the dynamic negotiation between an access point and an administrative agency, um, such as the, the effort that we have at the ITF um, called PAUSE, the PAUSE Working Group. We need to understand the requirements for this functionality, and the various agencies need to be comfortable with the types of solutions being built. My second point is that um, we all talk about how the Internet has enabled incredible innovation. And um, when we talk about governance issues or the involvement of governments this week, it is important to think about them in terms of what, what the future will bring and not just the today's Internet. I wanted to highlight something that we see in the technical community very well um, and at the ITF as well. The speed of innovation is increasing. For instance, the web protocol stack is undergoing significant change with HTTP 2.0. Voice over IP is moving to browsers um, with something called WebRTC. Uh, the Internet of Things is coming to many, many devices around us. Um, fundamental changes even in the basic networking standards are on the way, such as moving from IPv4 to IPv6. And, and the point that I want to make is that many of these changes have fundamental impacts to Internet government, governance and, and the way that various players, including governments, need to view them. Governing an almost limitless address space is very different from governing uh, scarcity. Uh, having any web server be capable of becoming a voice provider will make it difficult to regulate voice traffic. So these are real trends that are happening today. And, and my third and, third and final point is that I want to talk about the practical issues in working together between the government and the internet and technical community. I think all of us have, have realized that we need to do that and we need to do more of that than we have done in the past. We have the motivation. But there are a number of practical issues First, is use a little knowledge of what the other side does. I do not have the full picture of how government address technical issues or how regulation processes work. Similarly, the governments have historically talked to other types of organizations about technical or telecommunications matters. Now the situation today is quite different. Um, the, the world has changed. Uh, most of the work on internet technologies elsewhere. 
Um, standards organizations are different and may even work in different ways. We both need to learn how the other side works. For instance, at the ITF, we have an open model where anyone can contribute and our standards are um, uh, adopted by a voluntary basis. So in summary, my main point is that, that uh, I'm not so interested in discussing or maybe the question of what organization all this belongs to is, is not so interesting as the actual work. I mean, there's a lot of exchanges that have to be done um, between the different sides and a lot of practical discussion has to happen, a lot of learning has to happen, and, and that's the important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Yari. This is actually the first time an ITF chair is attending an IGF meeting and addressing an IGF meeting, and in many ways I would consider the IGF is the policy equivalent to the IETF. We don't take decision. We have a rough consensus approach here as well. Over to you, Avri, civil society perspective with a strong technical background. Thank you. I'm actually quite pleased to be up here with all these gentlemen in Bali. And, and um, I, I need to point out at one point I was sort of introduced as a representative of civil society. And to keep myself out of trouble, I must indeed say that my comments have not been reviewed by anyone in civil society. And in fact, I come with sort of a luxury of having been a civil society participant in policy world such as ICANN, in technical world such as IETF, and the IGFs, etc. So I, I'm actually given quite a luxury of sort of looking. When I look at the role of governments, I, I have to admit that I came to the acceptance of governments having a role very late in life. Um, and my first reaction for many years was, why? Why would they have a role? Now, over the years of, of, of IGF and such, and, and having listened to, to, to many wise ambassadors, ministers, and chairmen, I've actually come to accept that there is a role. But in looking at that role, I, I, I look for where would that role grow from? What, where would, what would be the origin of a government role? One of the first things that comes to my mind in terms of looking at a role for governments is indeed human rights and universal declarations of human rights and, and other instruments that have made the governments responsible for protecting our rights, protecting our rights in the non-internet world and protecting our rights on the internet. So that role of theirs as a protector of our rights does indeed mean that they really do have a role and I see that role as stemming from that. But in terms of, of understanding how that role can be played and how that role can, can be developed really depends on the degree to which they are defending those rights, the degree to which they are supporting a multi-stakeholder process that can be seen as growing out of our right to participate, to associate, to express, to learn, to share knowledge. So, Insofar as they protect us, insofar as they further the, the enterprise, indeed governments do have an important role. But that role really needs to be gauged by the degree to which they are indeed serving the, the, the people of the world, serving the people of their countries. The governments have come to the Internet sort of late. And, and, and so in, in that role, very often we, we do an analogy to the role that they took in telecommunications and have tried to sort of impose the role they took in telecommunications on the ideas of the Internet. Now, as we sit here on this panel, I'm very relieved to hear sort of that hasn't been the position of anyone on this panel, and yet I, I do have concern that that, that that is still the position of many in many governments and, and believe it's something that we, that we need to be careful of. One thing I see as a very important role for governments in multi-stakeholder processes is their capacity growth, that governments are new 
in many ways to the notions of cooperating with other sectors of society. Many have listened to us in, in various times, but, but they don't necessarily work with us. They don't necessarily cooperate. So over the years of, from, from the Working Group on Internet Governance to the WISIS to the evolution I've seen in the IGF, I have actually watched the capacity of governments to cooperate, both among themselves and with the rest of the stakeholders, has increased. And I think that that is also a very important part of government's role in, in these organizations, in these processes, is to actually increase their capacity to basically participate in a participatory democracy with us, that the democracy goes beyond the one that, that has elected many of them as representatives or perhaps as first or second order derivatives of representatives, but has actually something where they have learned to actually work with others. I'm very pleased as, as we, we get to the point where, where we hear that governments are indeed fostering freedom of expression, or at least are, are planning to, um, and, and, and indeed doing so at times. But that's new, and, and, and so that's something that, that I'm hoping that as governments become more involved, it does become more, that they do more to defend and support freedom of expression on the Internet, freedom of association on the Internet, freedom of assembly on the Internet. We need to go beyond. We need to basically look at all of the human rights that governments are charged with protecting and, and make sure that they are indeed doing that on the Internet. And I'm really glad to see a, 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 a realization of that, a growth in, in that process. Governments have a role in, in, in multi-stakeholder processes. The ITU has a role in, in multi-stakeholder processes. They are important roles. But I have a concern as they get more involved, as they get more of a role, that their role isn't a, a role that pushes the rest of us out of the tent. And, and so that's something that perhaps, again, being a sort of not having to vet my comments, um, that, that I basically can, can admonish us to really maintain a focus on that as governments get more of a role in the Internet, that that role does not in some way decrease the role of others in the Internet. So, um, so how can the governments continue to be involved without, in, in a sense, disturbing the involvement of the rest of the players in there. So as we approach 2014 with various summits and various proposed summits, I, I'm really looking at them with a bit of apprehension in terms of will we be allowed to observe? Will be allowed to participate? And the point to which we really haven't gotten yet, will we be allowed to participate in the decision making? Because once we are involved in the decision making with governments, governments will, in my view, have gotten to the point where their role in the multi-stakeholder process has actually come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Avri. Yes, that was a very interesting first round, and I wonder whether any of the panelists would like to have a spontaneous reaction to what one of the other panelists said. If not, we would then go to the... Yes, please. Ambassador Fonseca, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You were too quick, but i like to make very brief comments. Uh, just to... Uh, highlight and stress that we do not see there is a contradiction in operationalizing the role of governments uh, and disturbing the multi-stakeholder model. We do not see there is a contradiction. On the contrary, uh, we think that through capacity building, through uh, information and the identification of avenues for cooperation, 
some of the difficulties that were highlighted by other participants can be addressed, namely the identification of cases in which governments would feel comfortable enough to know there are processes that are taking place that do not require their participation. So I think that maybe rather than expanding the role or, or, or being an avenue to expand the role that can be that can give comfort to to governments that some of their concerns are being addressed and maybe identify ways through which uh, their, from a national point of view, a contribution can be made. Because, for example, if a government feels that in some aspect of internet governance there is not sufficient input from some country, it, it can be identified that it would not maybe be appropriate for the government to provide some, the input but other stakeholders from the country and then we can also discuss how that can be addressed. So uh, we see this exercise as something that is not leading to, to uh, let's say, the, the kind of danger that was highlighted. I think the danger is real. We must address this and make sure it does not, that by pursuing this, we are not, let's say, giving rise to something that is unintended, that would harm the mood stakeholder model. And Brazil fully embraces the mood stakeholder model. I want to... To, to repeat that. Uh, another point I'd like to make, you have mentioned, Mr. Chair, that this is the first IGF meeting that is attended by the chair of IETF. I would also say this is the first IGF meeting that is attended by a uh, Brazilian minister, uh, the Minister of Communications, that is in charge of Brazilian regulatory agency, is here in town and he will deliver a speech at the opening session as well. And it, it highlights the importance my government attaches to the multi-stakeholder model, and as Ambassador Sepulveda was saying, also the, to extend the hand to the exercise, to signal the intent to, 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 to be part of something larger than, than government. And indeed, one of the main messages my minister will convey, and I, I do not want to... Uh, anticipate too much what he's going to say, but he has already said that in yesterday at the high-level leaders' meeting, is that in preparation for the meeting we intend to hold in Brazil, be it a summit high-level, as President Dilma has proposed, uh, we wanted to have a very clear multi-stakeholder approach in the preparation, in its uh, realization, so one of the purposes of the minister coming here is to express very clearly that Brazil does not see this as an individual uh, initiative uh, that is coming from one country or one that we want it to be, not to be, the, let's say, the leader. It was said Brazil is leading this. We do not want to be seen as leaders, but as a, a, a party that wants to facilitate the discussion on some important aspects we feel should be discussed but with the full participation of all stakeholders. And this is the meaning of the minister coming here. This was uh, very clearly expressed by President Dilma, and it was also said that if you are not tweetable, you are not in the world. And President Dilma, yesterday, she tweeted, and she expressed clearly the, mood, the adherence to the mood stakeholder approach, and, the, and she highlighted that she was sending Minister Paulo Bernardo here to highlight that message. Uh, one, one point also I'd like to make, and I uh, want to be very clear about that, that Brazil, Marco Civil, the Internet framework we are discussing in uh, Brazil, uh, basically all its portions emerged, as was said uh, by another party, through consultations that were held previously. Uh, in that sense, there is a difference to the localization requirement that was included later on. But it must be said that this was included uh, as a result of the unfortunate developments that have been taking place in the last six months regarding disclosures of information. And this is one thing that occurred to government that should be made. This is part of the reaction. This, of course, is going to be discussed in Congress parties will have plenty of opportunity to intervene. Uh, there are different views. Some views argue it's not a good idea. Others will defend the opposite. There is a vibrant debate in, in Congress and in the Brazilian society now. 
And this is part of the democracy, of the legitimate uh, mechanisms we have. This will, the Congress will debate and make a decision on this. So this is uh, also something uh, I'd not like to, uh, uh, to, to let untouched in, in this meeting. Uh, and finally, uh, and I am sorry for taking so long, just to highlight that we view, we are very comfortable with this discussion since uh, Brazil is coming from a point in which we fully embrace multi-stakeholder model. We participate in the discussion with this approach. We, the government indeed tries to play this facilitating role, catalyst role in regard to multi-stakeholder participation. And we view uh, internet evolve into a new paradigm of cooperation among uh, countries and we want to be part of that. Again, we, we do not aspire to a leadership role. We don't think in the Internet it has a, a place for leadership, but rather uh, if we can assist and work together with all parties to address some, some of those concerns, we'd be more than happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And I note that at least on the panel we have a large consensus on the role of government. That there is, uh, I noted the government as a partner, and there's no dichotomy between government and multi-stakeholder cooperation. And several speakers uh, identified the need for capacity building, for building a culture of engagement, consultation, and the capacity to cooper for cooperation. And also, this is a process. We have not reached the end point, but we have made huge progress in developing a culture of talking to each other. I do remember also the beginning of WISIS, where it was rather awkward, where it was difficult. The techies had to learn diplomatic language. Diplomats had to learn to be more technical. But I think here now we have reached a level of, I would say, a comfort zone that we can engage in dialogue. And now I'm looking forward to the dialogue that Jeanette and uh, Matthew will engage from the floor. But can we maybe first turn to our remote moderators. Do we have contributions from? No, I see heads nodding. Okay, over to Jeanette and okay. Matthew. Um, by way of uh, kick-starting the debate, I'd like to offer a metaphor that I picked up from Ambassador Fonseca Fios' um, comment, and that is the notion of a living book. Um, perhaps we could actually look at this debate as an ongoing book we co-author or have been co-authoring over the last 10 years. From that perspective, we have perhaps reached now volume three. Um, when we look back at the discussion, and Marcus just mentioned that during WISIS, we could clearly see a very antagonist atmosphere and also an antagonist language that we were all speaking. And now we have sort of moved so much uh, closer to each other's perspectives and positions that perhaps we have now reached a point where we can indeed turn to more operational issues. Several of the speakers suggested that we should indeed look at practical issues of multi-stakeholderism. What do the um, the, multi, the, the stakeholders, what do they need to do to actually make this work in a better way than uh, in its uh, infant stage? So Marcus suggested the idea that the IGF might become a policy equivalent to the ITF. Is that conceivable? And what would it require to make this work? As you no, we have a list of questions that you can refer to, but of course you can also come up with your own questions if you have different ones. You can use the piece of papers that have been distributed, but you can also just grab a mic, um, <clears throat> whatever you like. So here are first questions. What about the remote participants? So perhaps you start. Uh, 
Thank you, Janet. Thank you for giving me the floor. My name is Subhi Chaturvedi. I'm a professor from India. I teach young girls communication policy and internet governance, and I run a foundation called Media for Change. Um, thank you, Bali. And they say, kiss me, salamat. Um, thank you so very much for a culture of innovation and acceptance. As the theme today is building bridges, and we have had very eloquent speeches, I'll keep my remarks brief. I want to carry the conversation further from where we left off yesterday, and these are called the taxi driver's diaries on internet and governance, because this is about innovation. I mentioned yesterday briefly about how they would ask me if I needed a taxi today, yesterday, day after, and I kept saying no. Um, since we're looking at an interesting problem to solve, here's what happened yesterday evening. They offered me a card and they said, do I want to change my destination or is it some other day that I'd like to take the taxi? I believe we're building bridges, but when we start to build bridges over choppy waters, it is important to set new landmarks and find common grounds of conversations. My question is to Ambassador Fonseca. Avery briefly mentioned when it comes to civil society, our challenges are many, especially when civil society and academia from developing countries are trying to get to a location which might need 30 hours of flying. There's a lot of common ground that India and Brazil share in culture, in democracies, in, in common cultures and histories and practices. We want to know whether we will be part of this conversation and how. When we talk about intergovernmental bodies and when we look at an experiment which is truly inclusive, bottoms up, transparent, like the IGF, um, it gives us opportunities to engage with each other in terms of conversations that we can have. Um, we want to know whether we will be in the room and what is it that uh, you will do to facilitate these conversations. Thank you so very much. Next. Jeanette. Jeanette, I've got somebody here. My name is Sonigitu Ekpe from government. My own is a question. How can Internet of Things be used to promote global governance and regional integration of nations? Since bilateral and multilateral agreements are not guaranteed due to challenges of transboundary policies and failure of legal framework to promote equality among nations and human rights. Next is Norbert. Thank you. Norbert Bolo speaking on behalf of the Swiss Open Systems User Group, which is an open source organization in Switzerland. I would like to start by quickly commenting on the idea that maybe the IGF is the policy equivalent of the IETF, I would say maybe the IGF could be part of a, something like that, but certainly a layer would need to be added on it that actually produces policy documents. The IGF does not create anything like internet drafts and RFCs. A layer, we absolutely need a layer to create something like that for policy. Addressing more the role of governments and obviously this kind of RFC-like process, it would strongly need to be tied somehow to the governments so that this output process from the IGF would become an input process for actual government or national lawmaking action. What's the point of having outputs if they are not used for anything? Speaking more specifically from the perspective of our group, which I said we are very interested in open source. We have been engaging in the IGF process for some years. And there are always great workshops here on the topics that we are interested in. But I have a big frustration what needs really to happen on the ground with governments actually understanding this and understanding how it 
can be used to apply to their problems and then doing it, making it happen. That is simply not happening. What is happening right now is that there are some things that are very much in the interest of big international companies and they have the capacity and skills and understanding to get done what is in an their interest to do, but the things that are not so much of their interest, they simply don't tend to get done. And I think governments need to take a much stronger role in just making these things happen. For an example, I would mention that free and open source software can have a huge role, a critically empowering role in preventing communication surveillance by foreign intelligence services. But this is not something that will happen on its own. It will need to be brought forward. My organization is very happy to be part of it, but governmental stakeholders also need to be part of it, otherwise it's simply not going to happen. Thank you. Parminder. Hello, yeah. Uh, I'm Parminder from an NGO IT for Change. And I thank the panel uh, to have presented one of the most uh, interesting and useful session I have ever uh, been at and any IGF. And I'm very sure this session's transcripts will be analyzed and seen uh, for some time. I also thank uh, the Honorable Minister from the UK to lay out a very good vision of what they see as the role of government, which I completely agree. And then Ambassador Gwendicto to have added a few points which makes it more contextual to the gov governance at the global level. Uh, also, uh, Virat Bhatia said a very important point, meaningful engagement. I think there are those points of agreement, and I take Janet's uh, evocation that we move to practical steps. Uh, and before that, I want to just have some clarifications. Like, I did hear that people should do it in their respective roles. Well, Tunis agenda is not sacred, but some kind of respective roles. But then I also heard equal footing. And when we go to practical things, that kind of thing needs a little more clarification. And I completely build on Virat Bhatia saying that it should be about a meaningful engagement and institutionalizing meaningful engagement. But then I heard every say, we need to participate in decision making, we as in non-gov stakeholders. And I think then line drawing is very important about what is the role of government. And when I say government, two things. I mean a democratic government, and I mean all pillars of the government, which is executive, judiciary, legislature. The role of the government for me are two. One is that they are the final institution which determines what public interest is. They take inputs, but they have then final judgment on the public interest. And then secondly, they use that judgment to make public policies which have a coercive force on citizens, and therefore they can only be done in a very responsible manner. So as long as there are not other stakeholders who want to be doing this, these two things, they have to participate, they have to be consulted, there should be institutionalized engagement model, but as long as they don't come and want to be doing that, that's important because that's a very basic democratic principle. And I often hear in the room that, that they want to be a part of decision making on equal footing, mm -hmm. a term whose meaning I completely lose. And that is of concern of many groups who believe in democracy and who believe in global democracy and multi-stakeholderism should not become a way to subvert democracy and the participation process should not become a way to paralyze public policy making because public policy is very important for marginalized Paminda, sections could you who cut want it greater short? equalization there are lots of people who of, want to speak uh, power yes janet uh, so a paralysis of public policy should not be allowed uh, to be created in that sense. Thanks, there, Janet. Thank you, Pamin. Is there somebody on the panel who would like to take this up and respond? Okay, then. Hello, I'm uh, Salinieta Tamanika Omero, uh, Salah for short, and I'm speaking from, on my own behalf and not for anyone. I'd just like to uh, first ask a question and then just perhaps just very. Actually, it's Salanieta, but that's okay. Uh, in terms of internet governance forums, and this is a question I pose to the panelists, 
in your mind in the year 2013 is public sector, private sector, and civil society, are they equal players when it comes to the Internet Governance Forum? That's my question. And the brief commentary, a very brief comment from me before I take my seat, and very quick, is this. For there to be a multi-stakeholder cooperation, um, and in terms of building trust and cross-collaboration, you can't have suspicion. And it, whilst you can have suspicion, uh, where you have suspicion, uh, trust can't really be built. And so that's why I asked my question. We have a remote participant. Is... Can we maybe help them go to the remote moderators? Thank you. Uh, the avatars of remote participation here. Uh, previously, there was a comment and probably a request for everyone to keep the microphone closer to the mouth so that, that the remote participants can hear so, or speak a bit louder. Uh, the question comes from Wafa Ben Hassin from Tunisia. Uh, and she says, how can we ensure that the governments have a legitimate and sincere interest in promoting multi-stakeholderism? And how can we overcome the lack of trust that emanates from all the sides, probably all the stakeholders also, particularly in developing countries. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mishi Chaudhry. I run a nonprofit organization in India. Um, my question is to um, the ambassador from the U.S. government. If the U.S. government really believes in the multi-stakeholder model it is espousing, what are the short-term and long-term plans of its practicing what it's preaching, wherein the entire world is now lost in the deluge of the revelations and is unable to see governments in any other light despite their important role. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want to respond? Uh, I do. I do wish to respond. Uh, the, the, the question is, uh, is eminently fair. And the question as I understand it, is how do your values, professed values, match your behavior? And again, a perfectly fair question. We have multiple systems by which we incorporate our multi-stakeholder community into our policymaking process. Uh, I actually come out of uh, civil society. I started my career as an activist, an immigration activist in Washington. My, the senator who became president of the United States, started his career as a community organizer and a civil society activist in Chicago. The Secretary of State started his career as an anti-war activist after the Vietnam War. And one of the most famous uh, visions of that was his participation before the United States Senate uh, and the testimony he gave after the war that helped mobilize the system in opposition to the Vietnam War and the closing of that particular event in our history. I can go through a litany of mechanisms by which we incorporate the public sector, academia, the technical community, industry in our public policy processes. We have an open advisory committee process. We have an open regulatory process. We have an open congressional process and we have an open press. As it relates specifically to the questions of, of surveillance and the degree of trust that has been uh, threatened in the Internet um, and relative to our position as a steward, uh, one of many stewards of the Internet, it is again a fair question. The President has spoken to it multiple times. Uh, I would let you know, and I'm sure you do know, but I will clarify that there are multiple forms of review ongoing relative to our intelligence review processes. There is an independent review of a five-panel expert session that we'll be reporting to the president and to the public. There are congressional reviews and open committee hearings on the subject. And there is an internal system of review within the administration. We, and the president has said on multiple occasions, uh, engage in intelligence gathering operations, much as most, if not all, of the countries of the world do. 
and we are in the process of ensuring that our intelligence gathering operations are consistent with our values, and we will be reporting to the world as that process moves forward. Again, the President, as you can read in the papers today, spoke with the French Prime Minister and made that comment again. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, and I'd be happy to elaborate on it if necessary. Thank you very much. Um, just to remind you, one of the questions here also refers to the rights and concerns of users in other uh, jurisdictions. That is perhaps uh, an issue that can be discussed in this environment. What about state actions that actually affect users, citizens of other jurisdictions? Thank you. Je Jeanette, please, can I make an organizational announcement? Yes. This issue obviously is high on the agenda of this year's IGF, and the session on emerging issues will be devoted on governance government surveillance. It will be on Friday morning, and it, don't look at the program as it is printed. Consult the program as it is on the website. The new, uh, we agreed that yesterday with the multi-stakeholder advisory group. The new program will be, the whole morning will be devoted to that issue. So there's a three-hour session on Friday morning devoted to government surveillance. And please keep consulting the website for changes. This was just an organizational announcement. This issue will also be discussed, uh, I would imagine, in the special session on human rights on uh, Thursday afternoon. And there may be other sessions and workshops as well. So. Hello, thank you. I am Jangi from Bangladesh. Uh, I am working on a non-profitable organization. My question is, I would like to share one issue, for example. The issue is, one policy in developing country is or may be working fine and good, but it may be challenges in developing countries. So how can we res resolve by implementing this issue by global policy? Or may we need internet government policy for resolve this issue locally? If not resolved locally, so how can we bridge between global and local policy to resolve this type of issue? An issue, one of issue I share you, for example, access control or filtering or cyber security. Thank you. I'd like to thank the panelists. For, my, for myself, I'm not sure whether there's translation. For me, in fact, the government naturally does have a natural function of safeguarding neutrality and the function of safeguarding the common good without forgetting its primary function, that of protecting the public good. But the question is, I'd like to know, how can we act in such a way that public activities don't get mixed up with the activities of individuals in an internet area, which is entirely taken up with what can be represented in two words, the word business, and freedom for those in the public sector and civil society in Africa. How can we act in such a way that we cover all of this? Um. Good morning. My name is Andres Piazza uh, from LACNIC, the Internet Addresses Registry for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the question is uh, related uh, to the recent um, launch of the Montevideo Statement done by 10 Internet organizations, and specifically not only directed to the two ambassadors uh, in the panel, but also to the rest of the panelists. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you think about the oversight role and uh, how do uh, would governments should behave uh, regarding this role in the future or maybe how this oversight uh, role should evolve in the short future. Thank you. Anybody wants to take this up? Please go ahead. 
Actually, I wanted to respond to the remote participant from Tunisia whose question is pending and also uh, my distinguished delegate here who spoke about uh, how do you combine the developing country piece with the uh, what's happening at the global level and how do you make it relevant. Um, <clears throat> and I'll drop on the um, four pieces that uh, the Honorable Minister from UK lent out. And if you look at that, that actually lends itself to a perfect example of how it's done. And I'll try and reference India a little bit because of the developing country part of the question. Uh, building infrastructure, as he spoke about, one of the first ones, unless the government provides the environment which is investor friendly and works with the private sector very closely, it would be virtually impossible to build infrastructure for the kind of internet that we see in the future. In fact, uh, in countries like India, vast majority of the infrastructure and subscribers of the approximately 900 million that are on the net, sorry, are on mobile and about 160 million who are on the net is owned and run by the private sector. And so government has a crucial role in consulting and implementing that. Uh, legal frameworks he spoke about, again, um, you can't do that unless you had engaged every uh, stakeholder in the community, especially the civil society, the lawyers, um, those who are going to be um, impacted by what's in the legal framework. Um, defending free speech, um, gender equality, removing child pornography, he spoke about those issues um, require a lot of engagement with civil society groups, uh, people who specialize in these parts because if the laws are not written in a manner that is acceptable. So each of the pieces that the Honorable Minister spoke about actually lends itself to how institutionally um, governments would get involved in the uh, multi-stakeholder engagement in a meaningful manner. But to answer the Tunisian question, um, I think uh, from the developing country perspective, where the traditions are not strong for uh, seeking consultation or including inputs into policy making, then in those areas, um, writing laws or um, principles that ensure such consultation actually does help and building such in independent institutions does help. I'll just close by saying that um, in the uh, telecommunications infrastructure that we built, which now underlays the entire internet traffic that is growing in India and the, and the subscriber base, there is a requirement under law for the regulators to consult uh, and act in a transparent manner. And a provision is available to those who are um, um, not happy with the decisions of the government or of the regulators in case they believe sufficient transparent consultation has not occurred and the inputs have not been taken. So wherever the traditions are not strong, bringing language into law, into policy is always helpful because then it sort of lays out clearly what different people have to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, hello and good morning. Uh, my name is Mossab Abdullah from the regulator in the Kingdom of Bahrain. For the, um, basically, I'd like to provide an observation, an emphasis, and finally a query uh, based on the comments. And uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the panelists for all their interventions. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, the minister from Brazil for his, uh, for his administration's uh, proposal. First of all, it's, my, it's been my observation through WICKET and the WTPF and the uh, de deliberations thereof that there's a lot of mistrust towards government. A, a, sometimes it's a misplaced mistrust. It's a, just an, a subconscious bias to the point where I have found that some people have been asking, why doesn't the Kingdom of Bahrain support the multi-stakeholder model? To which I would respond, well, I, we, we do. In fact, we were on record as having stated that. And this is just an example of that sometimes what we're saying is, is interpreted in light of what we expect to hear rather than what's actually being said. So I would caution against this uh, subconscious mistrust of governments and actually listen to the, the argument that, that is taking place. Now, the emphasis I'd like to, to place goes back to uh, some of the comments raised by the Honorable Minister from the UK, which is what is illegal offline is also illegal online. 
And this is what's guiding a large part of this discussion on public policies and with the role of governments in that public policy. Because ultimately, we have different laws, we have different customs, we have different frameworks throughout all, all the countries in the world. And yet, we have one internet. So how do we relate those physical boundaries into this new digital layer of geography that we have while making sure that everyone's rights and responsibilities are respected? Which finally leads me to my query. Where do we go from here? This, this has been discussed ever since the Tunis Agenda came out, and yet we find ourselves in, in a loop discussing the same points over and over. Now, hopefully, the, the recent di discussions that happened can actually break that cycle. So I ask, where do we go from here? Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope we, don't, we are not in a loop. Uh, I still uh, insist that we are moving forward, that the language is really changing. Um, now there's somebody from Indonesia. From Yes, thank you. My, my name is Edith Taim. I am from Indonesian ICT Society. Um, actually, I am not questioning, but I like uh, to support what has been mentioned by the His Excellency Minister from UK on uh, the um, even, even I'm coming from the society, but actually uh, on this discussion that I would like um, uh, to stress that we still do need the um, what is the inter intervention of the government. For instance, in Indonesia, um, we have been um, witnessing that the um, during these last two decades, the uh, the development of the uh, internet and this, this society is very um, uh, what is very extremely um, um, developing. Uh, with um, bad impact and positive impact also to the society, especially on the values and the cultures, on the education of the uh, the children also. So even um, even um, as in the, in the portion as the uh, society that I would like uh, you know uh, not too many uh, control from the government, the government. But when we do that the negative impact of the internet into the society is um, you know um, uh, not small actually, uh, especially on the education. Uh, in the cultural and the values, we still do um, uh, need the, the, the uh, what is it? Maybe, maybe not, not saying that this is control, but the intervention from the government. The government. This is what I like uh, to, to endorse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anybody from the panel who wants to comment on this? Otherwise, there would be now a question directed to Honorable Mr. Minister Advaisi. Uh, no. Jeanette, we have somebody over here who would like to speak, if okay. that's okay. Uh, thank you no. very much. My name is Santosa from Indonesian ICT Society. So I just want to continue what my colleague just mentioned regarding the statement made by the Minister uh, at Fesrici mm -hmm. from UK. Well, when the government intervention from the business sector, usually we are thinking that there is another charging will be done. Because usually when they intervene, mm -hmm also related also to the license. License is main cost. So how do you, let's say, uh, act on this kind of, let's say, uh, behavior of the government? I believe in developing country, a lot of government also to want to collect the money from this kind of services. Thank you. I'll try and answer some of the points as best I can. Uh, first of all, I'm pleased that my four points are now framing the discussion, which was my original intention. So thank you for the last three questioners uh, and indeed uh, some of the panelists to referring those, to those four issues. I think um, if I start with what the uh, panelist from Bahrain, the regulator from Bahrain, said, where do we go from here? Uh, earlier, uh, one of our moderators talked about this being a, a book that is being continuously uh, written. So... Uh, one doesn't necessarily uh, know which uh, direction the journey will take. I think the, uh, the point is that the authors um, should include everyone from our society, so government, business, and civil society in that discussion. That is the fundamental point I want to make. Uh, clearly... Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, governments will pass legislation which affects 
what happens on the internet. We as a government have passed legislation, as I said earlier, that was specifically directed to enable uh, rights holders to send letters to um, people who were infringing copyright by downloading on the internet. And we did that through legislation, although we haven't actually implemented it. In contrast, in the United States, a voluntary agreement has been reached between the telecom providers and the rights holders to send warning letters to people who are infringing copyright. So the United States has taken a voluntary approach. We've gone down a legislative route. Then you can flip that over, and uh, we uh, allow rights holders to use existing copyright legislation to get an injunction to block a website uh, where infringing material is, uh, is present. Uh, Newsbin 2 was the first website that was uh, blocked in this way, and it was using existing civil legislation. And it didn't cause really any controversy uh, in our country. But by contrast, in America, when uh, that was proposed as legislation, it caused a titanic uh, debate, uh, and that uh, proposal was dropped. So in terms of how government legislates, um, different cultures will take a different uh, approach and two very similar cultures, perhaps the UK and the US sometimes take different approaches to tackling uh, the same issue um, but I return to my point that that is government intervention in an issue which happens to involve the internet if I can put it that way so we as governments take the protection of intellectual property extremely seriously clearly the internet affects uh, how intellectual property can be attacked. We take the protection of our children extremely seriously. Clearly, the prevalence uh, of the Internet affects how children can be affected by inappropriate content. Uh, and so there's nothing, I think, philosophically... Uh, there's no kind of philosophical barrier that says government shouldn't intervene in this way. But where... I feel very strongly, uh, and I think my, my government feels very strongly, is that government shouldn't uh, seek to put in place a framework to control the Internet. And we feel that for philosophical reasons, because of our support for freedom of expression. Uh, but we also feel it for practical reasons, because we've seen the innovation that a free Internet has brought about. Uh, the barriers to entry being relatively low, the opportunity to engage with millions and now billions of people uh, in different ways are absolutely formidable. So I think when we are debating this constant debate, this constant journey about the multi-stakeholder approach versus a government regulatory approach, Everyone should realize, and trust is important here, but everyone should realize, developed nations and developing nations, how important the multi-stakeholder approach, and it was formalized at WISIS, but it was, it's always been there, how important that approach has been to supporting the innovation we've seen on the Internet. And that if you take a top-down approach, you risk shutting out uh, incredibly important voices who have just as valid points to make about the future direction uh, of the internet. So, uh, you know, the internet is constantly evolving. We don't know uh, what the fourth, fifth, or sixth volumes of the book we're writing collectively uh, will be. Uh, but as I say, the fundamental principle must be that there should be multiple authors with equal voices. Thank you very much. Perhaps, can I just ask a follow up question and remind you of the first question that was collected? And there was the first one actually asked whether the governments which pitch for multi-stakeholderism in the international arena also adopt internet-related policy making in their respective countries uh, within the multi-stakeholder approach. Since you referred to domestic legislation regarding protecting uh, intellectual property rights, could you imagine uh, as the UK government to do this within the framework of multi-stakeholder policy making? Well, I mean, we do follow through in the sense that we uh, were the first ones, I think, to set up a domestic uh, IGF. We have the 
uh, the multi-stakeholder advisory group on internet governance, which helps frame our policy towards uh, the internet. But again, uh, we as a government obviously consult on all our, all our legislation, so we are a, a free, open, and democratic society. Whatever legislation we propose, regardless of whether it relates to the internet or not, is consulted upon. Uh, it can be uh, challenged. In fact, the legislation that we put in on intellectual property, which was specifically aimed at protecting intellectual property rights on the internet, was challenged in the courts. Uh, and government, could, you know, we had to amend the legislation as a result, only in a small technical way. We effectively won the court case. So uh, we always do consult. But again, it's important to say that uh, I think our approach to the internet, in internet policy making, is very much multi-stakeholder. Thank you. There was another comment I, on the I, panel. I, I was just going to add on this whole issue about the constant changing scenario and the changing role of the governments. Um, and I just want to reference the case from India again for your consideration. Um, it, as I said, we have about uh, what the world's second largest population for, well, first second largest population in the world and then the second largest uh, mobile population in the world. And consumers who use mobile phones were contributing 5% of their total uh, bill every month to the USO fund. But um, the business was so good and it grew so well that the need for the USO fund to put out phones in rural areas and those who couldn't afford it was never required. So billions of dollars were collected by way of this fund. And the government changed TAC midway about five years ago and converted the USO fund that was meant for rural telephony and changed the rules, changed the legislation and is using that money to build uh, the first large $4.5 billion national fiber optic network which will be devoted and ensuring that 250,000 villages are connected through that process. This is one of the many things that the government can do, as this book is written, on the first piece that the Honorable Minister spoke about, which is building infrastructure, where in a unique case, consumers have contributed to money for rural telephony, which has now gone on to build a national internet backbone. So I'm just giving you one example, but there are many such places where governments can continue to innovate in their role as this book is written, because it couldn't have been imagined that this would be the use of this fund even five years ago. Thank you very much. Now I'll hand over to you. Thank you. My name is Dewey. I am from Ministry of ICT of Indonesia. Um, I would like to address my opinion about multi-stakeholder. First of all, it, uh, about the motivation of uh, the each party involved in multi-stakeholder itself. So there is a huge difference of motivation from each party. For example, in uh, gover the government, we often, uh, our motivation to, like, to regulate in the Internet is uh, often motivated by how to keep the country, how to keep the sovereignty of the country. Meanwhile, the, profit par the, the private parties, uh, their motivation is mainly about uh, how the demand and supply, how, how much the profit I can I gain from this business. So, and the civil society is somehow in between. And uh, the second thing is about multi-stakeholders is I tend to see that uh, developed country uh, who already apply the multi-stakeholder tend to force uh, the multi-stakeholder system to developing country with the same pattern. They, they seem like want to copy-paste the, their model, the, the model of multi-stakeholder in their country to a developing country, which is maybe doesn't work because we have different uh, culture, we have different style, we have different government system. Uh, in regulating the Internet itself. So this is the main concern for me if we're talking about the most stakeholders. Because like last week, uh, I talked with a, a representative from Microsoft when we discussed about one of the minister regulations. So 
they, they often talk about profit, demand, supply, and then we talk about how to keep our country from uh, surveillance, how to keep our society from pornography, how to keep... So this is like kind of like contradict uh, uh, r uh, roles and interests. Then, and I hope that uh, Internet Governance, IGF, uh, can facilitate the, those uh, different interests, how we meet our, at least, I, I don't hope that we, we really came up with the same interests, but at least we uh, understand each other. So uh, as a government, I often feel that like society uh, see me as an enemy. And some of private company see me also as an enemy when we talk about data protection or, or building infrastructure building. It's uh, when the government try to uh, kind of limitation, uh, give limitation, uh, we often seen as an enemy of the internet development. I think so, that's a very interesting point, and I think that uh, it's important uh, when government is subject to criticism and. Uh, People quite rightly want to say government shouldn't over-involve itself in the Internet or regulate the Internet. I uh, would echo to a certain extent what you say, that business and civil society must also understand government's perspective. So, again, returning to some of the issues that exercise great passion in the UK, protection of our children, protection of intellectual property, it is, I think, incumbent on business and Internet businesses to understand what government wants to achieve and to work with government. Uh, and funny enough, that is the best way of preserving uh, the multi-stakeholder model. It's the best way of ensuring that this partnership, this very strong partnership, which has been so important to the development of the Internet, continues. And it's a rather, it's a paradoxical thing when you talk to an Internet company who says, we will only do this if you pass legislation, which seems to invite government to regulate the Internet. And what they should be saying is we understand and share your concerns and we'll work with you to provide tools. And that's what's happened in the UK. So with telecoms providers, they now provide the filters for consumers to use if they want to block pornography in their home. And uh, that is a good coming together of a public policy issue working in partnership. So it is important, you're quite right, that uh, business and civil society shouldn't see government as the enemy, just as government shouldn't see business and civil society as a problem they have to deal with. Please, uh, um, Ambassador. Ambassador Fonseca would also like to react. Uh, thank you. Actually, I'd like to maybe at this point react to some interventions and I think some very good points were made and I think we should to the extent possible also react to some notions that were presented. So first of all I'd like to address the professor from India. I think she raised a very important point regarding what would be the Brazil's, Brazil's view in regard to participation of stakeholders and I understood in the light of the preparation for the meeting in Brasilia. So as I have said at the beginning we intended to be completely part have a participatory uh, nature from the beginning, from the inception. From uh, We have, of course, some ideas, and the minister will spell some of those ideas in line with what President Dilma has already expressed at the General Assembly. But we want to, it to be a constructive uh, work, and that stakeholders should be fully involved. So answering to your questions, Yes, we want you to be in the room and be a participant in, in the process. Uh, in regard to the concern that I also expressed that our proposal should not only be seen as a, a way to enhance participation of governments. So of course, as government, we are looking how to operationalize the participation of government, but we are also concerned about other stakeholders' participation. I'd like to... to make reference to a very uh, good partnership we have with the Brazilian Steering Committee. You know, of course, government has budgetary constraints uh, of many nature, but through the Brazilian Steering Committee, participants from civil society are fine. They can come to these meetings uh, with the 
monies that are collected uh, through the operation of .br, part of it is also this destined to, to this end. I think this provides a very good example of how uh, we can work constructively, government, the government is in the Brazilian Committee, so it, that we are not outside it, but as a body, how it can assist in, in providing further uh, assistance to, to other stakeholders. And I say this because, of course, you know of international organizations that collect millions of dollars, and I think it would be very good if that could also be used to support to, to have a public interest in mind and support uh, the, the system as a whole. I think that would be a very good way to use the money that is collected. Uh, I'd like also to address uh, what Parminder said about uh, equal footing, and uh, I don't think we should maybe, uh, engage a lot on this, but uh, as we read, uh, as we go through what is stated in, in regard to the, uh, to the design of international public policies pertaining to the Internet, it is clear that it is something that governments should be implemented is on an equal footing. So the, the reading of paragraph 6 and 9 seems to indicate that as regard the design and adoption of public policies, uh, when we are talking about equal footing, we are referring to governments. And of course, we are this is in the context of the multi-stakeholder model that is, let's say, an overriding concept that should be there. But as we refer to this particular issue regarding public policy, it's clearly on the, on the side of governments. Uh, I don't know if this would address what Paminda said, because sometimes we are confusing that the multi-stakeholder model should embrace everything. And I think it's the, the part of the beauty of the model is that each stakeholder has roles and respondent. Uh, there were many interventions related to how can we expand and have a larger role for IGF and the notion that IGF could be the policy equivalent to IETF. And I'd like to comment that my delegation strongly supports that IGF would have more effective uh, participation. Its outputs could be more uh, uh, out, outcome oriented, not maybe is not the, the word, but would have more resonance outside the context of its meetings. When I was in Baku last year, it was my first IGF. I was uh, extremely uh, pleased with the debate. I could participate, I could attend the wealth of information, of uh, notions that were conveyed, the, the, the vibrancy of the debate, and this is not exactly captured as the outcome. I think this is something my delegation will strongly support that we seek uh, uh, ways. Uh, alongside the, the working group uh, recommendations, I think we should be working on that in that direction. Uh, another point I'd like to comment as well regards the, this breach of trust, and of course this is something that will be dealt in the final session, but only to say that from the perspective of my delegation, there is a lot, some part of a way of addressing this is reinforcing the debate on ethics and, and privacy. This is something Brazil initiated at UNESCO and it will be taken up by the next general conference in November. Uh, and I would also refer to the speech that President Dilma delivered at the United Nations that Maybe the time is right for us as a community, international community, to uh, launch a discussion on principles and norms that should govern Internet. And she referred to the concept of an international civil framework based on our own experience. Uh, we think this is maybe a constructive way through which we could, uh, uh, out of this uh, these circumstances uh, try to further refine the, the framework we have. We think it would be uh, indeed a very important development if we could get to this. Uh, another point is the kind of oversight role that governments could uh, play, uh, and I think the question referred to the Montevideo Declaration. Uh, I would interpret that maybe this is referred to, to ICANN specifically. And uh, what, one thing I'd like to comment in that regard is that we see the 
oversight role of governments uh, being made without any detriment to the multi-stakeholder dimension of, of the organization. This is something to be clearly preserved. The multi-stakeholder dimension, the bottom-up uh, decision-making should be preserved, but then uh, we see ICANN evolving uh, and being commensurate with the challenges and the, the context of the 21st century as uh, uh, an institution that would have an international, let's say, oversight more than one single country oversight. Uh, and finally, I'd like to just to refer some of the intervention said that developing countries do not have a tradition of consultation. It's very dangerous sometimes to make that kind of uh, statement. Uh, developing countries uh, are more than 100 countries with different circumstances, different contexts. In the case of Brazil, we have a very strong tradition of consulting with civil society. Uh, we have had in the last years over 100 national conferences on issues such as human rights, child uh, rights, uh, you name it, that started at local level and then state level, regional level, and finally national level. So we, again, we are very comfortable with the notion of consulting widely with the population and uh, we would uh, 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 say that, that, that that's the complexity as we are looking at all the, the points we are raising from an international perspective. There are so many different ways in which countries deal with uh, those issues that it, it's a tremendous challenge. And finally, the point, <laughs> I'm sorry if so many issues, but the point that was raised by, uh, I think, the last speaker, regarding motivation of governments. Uh, I was a bit surprised because in the case of Brazil, our motivation to participate is goes much beyond the protection of sovereignty. We want through government participation also make sure there is adequate consideration to the issue of inclusiveness, social inclusiveness, and also to fostering an environment for economic prosperity, development, uh, we are also concerned about uh, human rights, child abuse, all this. So it's uh, much complex, I think, the kind of interaction government uh, has. And I fully agree with Minister Advezi that the important thing is to make sure that uh, as government is participates in the multi-stakeholder model, it will not be seen in contradiction or, or being an enemy to other views, rather that maybe the perspectives are different, but the, the concerns are also very wide, since governments have, of course, as also as the UK paper indicates, uh, a very wide-ranging responsibility regarding public interest, so that permeates va various areas, so it's not restricted to one single concern. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank, this conference. Thank you. We have more from this panel, and I would also like to say a few words in terms of organization of the session, picking up from our colleague from Bahrain, where do we go from here, and also what you said, that we, uh, I think, collectively agree that we want to take the IGF a step further and come to takeaways, more type of tangible outcomes in whatever form they will be. So this can also be in the Chairman summer, summary that we really, and that is in line with the recommendations from the CSTD working group on IGF improvements that we highlight where we have points of convergence, but we can also emphasize that there may be points of divergence where we don't agree. But having listened to this discussion, I find we have broad points of convergence, and Minister Vase's uh, framework of the four themes, I think, found very broad support. While we might discuss on some of the details of the regulation, but I think the fact that governments have a responsibility for infrastructure, for setting the legal and regulatory environment, and also the duty to protect human rights and freedom of expression uh, has been, uh, nobody contests that, I think, in this room, and it has found broad support. Human rights, to begin with, we didn't discuss that in particular, and that really emerged over the years as a very central issue 
in internet governance discussions. And then I think maybe first and foremost, when we talk about the role of governments, that we talk about partnership with the other stakeholders and that governments should not be seen as the enemy. Although some uh, remarks from the floor implied that this may still be the case, but I think at least I would feel that this room agrees that this should not be, uh, we should move beyond that and governments should definitely not be seen as enemies. They do have a role and we have to work with governments. But the remark to, uh, that some developing <coughs> countries may have problems finding their way around the multi-stakeholder system uh, clearly relates to the importance of capacity building and that was also made, that point was made by several speakers that we need to assist also developing countries to find their way in the, into the multi-stakeholder system, help them to build a culture of consultation, engagement, and to have the capacity to cooperate. And that can also mean uh, financial assistance, as quite often it's also traveling involved. Uh, so uh, where do we go from here? I would agree with my co-moderator, Jeanette, that uh, we do go forward. Well, sometimes it may seem as we are going around in circles, but I think it is an upward spiral. We may revisit the same issues, but we revisit them at a higher level of understanding, of comprehension, and uh, also of culture of dialogue. Uh, but please feel free to disagree with my attempt to try and capture the discussion. This is the only way to validate it, and, but if you all agree, I think we do have already, I would say, a good takeaway. But uh, let's uh, also listen to from the floor. And before going back to the floor, Ambassador Sepulveda wanted to react. Please. Um, very quickly before returning to the floor, I wanted to, uh, in the first instance, uh, understanding that we would all like to see continued improvements in all of our internet governance institutions, including the IGF. I do want to take a moment to value the conversation that we're having right now and that it is a conversation and not a competition and a discussion and not a debate because the pressure of solving or imposing a solution on all as a function of this conversation is not imposed on the conversation itself. I think that there's immense value in that. It allows us to have a frank and open discussion about issues that are very, uh, that are still not resolved either within ourselves or between us. And that there, there is an immense amount of value in that process in and of itself. I would hope that we continue to value that. Um, I would also like to take a, a moment to note that I think there has been immense progress uh, even in the, in the short time that I've served in, bringing, in coming closer together on what we see as challenges and what are potential solutions to those challenges. So in the first instance, for, exa for example, we wholly agree with uh, the analysis of Brazil and others that de developing country governments and developing country societies, including industry and civil society and academia and the technical community in, developing, in the developing world, does not have adequate participation and does not have adequate uh, room at the table and voice for participation in the existing internet governance institutions. The question then becomes, how do we make that real? And I would say that there has been real progress at the, at the different institutions in making an effort toward that, and I would say that that, uh, that effort call has been heard to a large degree. So, and, and that manifests itself in the multiple offices that ICANN, for example, is, is uh, opening around the world the increase in financial support that is being being given to developing countries to go to ICANN to participate in that, the increasing sophistication of the GAC and the increasing participation of the GAC at ICANN, for example. But that isn't to say that uh, that we can't do better. It isn't to say that we don't uh, don't agree that, that there's a need for collaborative work to improve on the system. And I think that that this conversation and the the continued conversations and the, the answer to the question of where do we go from here, well, it, it sounds like we're going to Brazil in April, uh, but 
we'll have to see how that particular event is constructed. But then there's Egypt uh, or wherever, where, or the, where the World Telecommunications Development Conference will be held, and then the Plenty Potentiary in South Korea. We, we have continuous meetings because we're building on the previous work and the areas of consensus where we can come together in good faith toward the, the, toward the end that we all want, which is the full inclusion of everyone in the world in an open and inclusive Internet. And I think, so from the, from the point of view of the United States and building on many of the things that the, the, the minister from the UK has said, we, for example, have a global broadband initiative in which USAID is helping countries around the world in the development of national broadband plans and in the development of universal service fund programs. We uh, spearheaded the Alliance for an Affordable Internet, which is bringing together a, a public-private partnership with uh, up to 30 different actors um, from, from the tech technological community, from, from the public sector and the private sector, to talk about what the public policies are that we can put into place, many of which the minister covered are working well in the UK, for example. How can we adapt those kinds of pro-investment, pro-deployment policies around the world to ensure that everyone has access? So. I think that, that we, we are coming together around a set of common causes uh, that are rooted in the democratic, small d democratic deployment and inclusion of everyone in the global internet. And I think that that's a positive development. Uh, Chair, we have a couple more questions from the floor. Thank you. Um, good morning, afternoon. My name is Walter Natris. I'm a private consultant representing the NL IGF. Can you speak also. a bit louder, please? Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Walter Natris. I'm a private consultant, but also representing NL IGF. Um, we're going to do some pretty good sessions on Thursday morning and afternoon, in which most of you are somehow represented with best practices on breaking down silos. Do you need to put bridges. the microphone a bit closer. Closer? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Like this. That's better. Okay. Um, we're going to have some pretty good examples, actually, with most of you represented uh, in the panels we are doing. But to come to my question, I've got about three different ones which are all together. But I want to start with giving you a very small personal experience I had this month uh, with the Internet Society, where uh, I did represent the Dutch government to teach governments about spam enforcement in the Netherlands. And after I'd given my presentation, what actually happened is that the questions turned to the gentleman next to me representing the ITU in South America and saying, can the ITU help us with this? Instead of help asking me how could we do something together, they asked the ITU. And afterwards, I went to these people and asked, why did you ask the question to the ITU gentleman? And they said, well, we asked these questions to the ITU because we do not know anybody else. And this was several local governments from South America. And when I started engaging them further, they said, well, the IETF has never been here and we don't really know anybody from the IETF, so how could we ever do something technical? Well, that's just a few examples. Then I come to my questions, is that how can you, industry, technical community, governments, actually change this in the course of the coming years so that there is more knowledge spread to several regions where perhaps these organizations never come, like the Message Energy Abuse Working Group, which is an industry initiative basically in the U.S. and in Europe. They can't, don't go to South America because they don't have any members there, so there's no sponsoring, no etc. So how could governments actually, together with industry, make sure that this sort of knowledge goes into these regions? So. And as a last question, is there actually a clear view on what the needs of governments in regions where these sort of uh, uh, conferences take place may actually not go to? So is there a clear view on the needs of local governments in developing countries? So thank you. I, I suggest uh, gathering uh, questions yes. from the floor. I know that Yari would like to answer, but you ha let's have a, a, a final round for the panelists to react to all the questions we gather uh, so that we have a, a good conclusion. Can we, can we first give the floor to Avri? She has 
Okay. Then the moderator. I maybe okay. <coughs> So uh, Wafa Ben Hassina again uh, from Tunisia, and she is also in the United States. So she asking, uh, there is a moral discrepancy going on when developing countries promote human rights and practice secondary, and yet they don't act on these values. I'm sure that the vast majority of U.S. citizens do not appreciate the privacy inventions that U.S. government has yet to admit to, since we all know is from leaks. H how? Uh, can we adequately discuss the government not being an enemy uh, when our government consciously engage in practices that are diametrically opposite to what our policy platforms articulate? Beyond uh, public-private uh, partnerships, how can we involve the average citizen in this conversation? Thank you very much. Are we still in the process of collecting questions? Yeah. There's Arnold van Rijn. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to um, thank the, um, the panelists uh, for their uh, presentations. Um, I really like the uh, phrase by Minister Fezi when he said that the uh, role of governments uh, should be seen as a network partner instead of uh, someone who dictates. That's precisely what we are doing in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, our government, in, in particular our ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, are right now busy uh, developing a, uh, a long-term study um, on uh, how the Dutch telecom market looks like in about five to ten years and what the place of the telcos would be in the internet value chain. Uh, this whole process, uh, what is now going on, uh, is, is a cooperation with all the partners involved, the NGOs, the private sector, uh, the technical society, and so on. So, uh, in our view, this national model of cooperation is a good one, a good one for the future to, to continue to build on. And what would be fine and wonderful if it uh, uh, would be uh, in place in an international, uh, on an international level. On the other hand, uh, I heard also from the, one of the panelists, I think it was uh, Avery Doria, when she stated that uh, she had some concerns about the bigger role of governments in this whole process because they, uh, they would push out the other parties for, out of the tents, uh, if I quoted her correctly. Uh, so this indicates, uh, in my view, that we're all struggling to find the right role of, of governments in this whole process. And I think it touches upon the essence of the multi-stakeholder model, and that is that all parties involved should act on equal footing. Now I have a question for uh, the panel, and that is, how would you interpret the concept of acting on equal footing with respect of the role of governments? Thank you. Are there any further questions? You have another one. First of all, I'd just like to say that this is a really fantastic conversation. And uh, I'm really glad to see the maturity uh, and the level of uh, trust uh, expressed and just hearing the diversity of perspectives uh, coming through. And I think uh, for me, hearing this now, it heralds um, a significant uh, tomorrow for Internet governance. And what I'd just like to add to the conversation is this. Um, in terms of the increasing accountability and transparency within existing mechanisms. Uh, and, and I know that a lot of the organizations are already working uh, vigorously and robustly in this area. But this is something that really should um, be pushed uh, uh, from the IGF space, increasing accountability and transparency. The other thing also is in terms of increasing meaningful participation it's bringing people to the table. So, for example, even within the GAC, within ICANN, I'm not sure. There, I know that there are 193 countries, but I don't think that you have 193 uh, representatives of governments to the table. And so the issue is not ICANN. The issue is bringing governments to the table and that sort of thing. And by the way, these are my own views. These are not the views of any of my, any of my affiliations and associations. The other thing is standards bodies. Uh, it doesn't matter, matter whether it's a national standards body or whether it's an international standards body. 
but ensuring that there's greater accountability and transparency where nations can actually trust, uh, that you can trust that there's integrity in how uh, things are actually processed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Nigel Hicks and I can Just a, uh, a point and a question, if I may. Uh, the, the point is, uh, ICANN has been mentioned a couple of times, and I would like to endorse what uh, our Mexican colleague said, that uh, ICANN is uh, looking to uh, internationalize its operations. We have uh, uh, open various offices in, in different regions. And can the whole... you put the microphone closer to your mouth? Yeah, you, usually I, my voice is loud enough, but I, I can do that, yes. So, yeah, so I, I, Fadi Jahadi, our chief executive, has embarked on an operation to, to globalize the whole of the ICANN operation, and uh, many people uh, that come to ICANN meetings can, uh, can, can see that firsthand. The GAC is 129 uh, countries. We hope that will be expanded. There might be countries here that are not in the Government Advisory Committee, and we greatly uh, encourage them to be part of it. The comment, sorry, the question I have is that I don't think I've heard, and I might have been asleep, of course, is mention of the World Summit on the Information Society and the review that's currently taking place. I think it was mentioned uh, by the uh, U.S. ambassador that uh, the ITU review conference is taking place in Egypt, or was going to take place in Egypt in, in April, of course, and that's an important step. But there's also a further step when the U.N. General Assembly have to review uh, the WISIS arrangements in uh, 2015. And perhaps the panel might uh, sort of just give an indication of what they hope will happen in terms of the WISIS review. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Janet, and thank you, Chair. I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, thank you for the second opportunity. I do want to reiterate the point that a colleague mentioned about keeping solutions local and domestic where problems can be solved locally. But um, the IGF is a wonderful platform. And, Marcus, this is a question for you. I do want to see more young people and more women, from, especially from emerging economies and marginalized communities. And you wear many hats. So if you could dwell slightly more on the ISOC ambassadors programs and what is it that IGF as a platform is doing to bring in new voices that is a real concern we have um, also in terms of solving problems at a local level and internationalizing experiences and institutionalizing best practices I do want to invite the house and everyone here to an open forum that the Indian government is putting together to tell the India story because the next billion users are coming online from these parts of the world so day three everyone's welcome room three Eleven o'clock. Please do join us. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm from the University of Aarhus, and I want just to add a question to the issue raised by the gentleman from the Dutch Foreign Ministry when he asked the panel uh, what the government think about equal footing. You know, a lot of this multi-stakeholder. Um, discussion goes back to the definition of Internet governance, which was elaborated by the Working Group on Internet Governance and adopted by the heads of states. And in the first part of the definition, we have these various roles of, government, or of stakeholders in their respective roles. But in my eyes, the second part of the definition is even more important, uh, because the second part speaks about shared decision-making procedures, shared norms, protocols, programs, and decision-making procedures. And I think Avi raised this, Aza raised this. So we are, when we are moving forward, we have to face that somebody has to take a decision. So my question is to the governments when they react to the question from the gentleman from the Netherlands about equal footing, what is their idea about sharing decision-making with other stakeholders. Thank you very much. So perhaps the Tunis agenda also needs to be regarded as a living book, where we sort of start to reinterpret uh, original meanings. Shall we hand over to... Yeah. Um, Jeanette, maybe I can ask a question or build on some of the questions. We heard from the gentleman from Bahrain that he was asking, what's the way forward? Uh, Minister Vesey partially responded to that. Um, Nigel from ICANN has uh, put a question out there as to the evolving landscape over the next 18 months. And I was wondering if you, if the panel would mind commenting on how they see the importance of and how multi-stakeholderism will 
evolve in the context of the WSIS, the WTDC, the ITU plenipotentiary. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, back to the panel with that. And I think also let's bear in mind that there will be various other sessions during this week that will relate to similar issues. Tomorrow we will have a session on Internet governance principles and on principles of multi-stakeholder cooperation and enhanced cooperation. We will have a session on human rights uh, and as I already said, the session on emerging issues will be on surveillance. And the very last day, we have the opportunity to, uh, with an open microphone session, to take stock of the whole week. And these issues will be addressed in various sessions. Now, who would like to go first? Shall we just follow down the line and maybe start with Avrish? He wanted to uh, talk. Avri, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, I appreciate this chance to respond to things. There were so many that I would like to respond to, but I think I'll restrict myself to very few. But one of the things that I did want to go back to is the question that we were given on the sheet, the number three question in the second set, which says, can the exercise of sovereign rights by nations be restricted when it encroaches the rights of users in other jurisdictions, or I would go, or even in the rights of users in their own jurisdictions. And I think that, that one of the things that we need to look at when we're talking about Internet governance and, and the restrictions that some governments do put on the human rights as expressed on the Internet. And at a certain point, when those human rights are restricted on the Internet, groups like this that go beyond just a single national interest need to look at those and need to look at them very directly and, and, and need to, to basically not flinch away from a certain regard for those human rights because of a older notion of sovereignty that says, on the outside of my walls, nothing I do can be discussed. Nothing I do can be faulted. And so the, the Tunis agenda does not restrict us, but rather puts us on an equal footing where anything that goes on in one country is open to the discussion of the rest. If what is going on is not in keeping with human rights as generally known and generally expressed, it is open to our discussion, it is open to our deliberations, and it should be open to our advice. And, and I think that that's a, a very important point for us to come back to, is that we can go beyond the, the, the narrow uh, notion of, of, of sovereignty in, in the countries because the countries have agreed to bind themselves, to make themselves responsible to human rights. And I think it's our responsibility in the, the, the IGF and in all of our other efforts to always go back to those human rights documents that have been signed, that have been agreed to, and ask the questions, is what a particular country is doing in keeping with their obligations? And I could go much further down those lines, but I think that that is the measuring stick for any of our discussions going forward and sort of using the cloak of sovereignty to protect actions and, and, and philosophies and motivations that go against documents we have signed is something that we really cannot accept silently. And I guess I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Yari? Thanks. So, again, um, there were many, many points. I'll just uh, touch on two. Um, the, um, the first one that I wanted to raise was this question of governments and other types of uh, bodies being uh, more aware of each other. And I think we all have a responsibility for, for making that, that to happen. At the IETF, we've had very good um, success and, and experiences from um, the, the ISOCs uh, policy 
guest program where we draw on um, you know, people around the world from various different places, um, you know, go- uh, regulator, government, policymaker type people, and introduce them to the ITF. And it's been a very successful program. And thank you, ISOC, for that. Um, I think similar types of programs exist in other organizations. I think um, that the rest of the world could probably take some um, some lesson here as well, and 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 where it's not applied, it, 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 it's probably a useful model to do. The other thing that we've had good experience with at the IETF is is when our leadership, you know, where the working group chairs, experts, ADs, um, or myself, go out and you know try to reach out to the, to the other direction, go talk to governments and yeah, various types of organizations, and you know inform of you know what's coming down the pipe, and what's happening, and, and trying to pool for information that's also been pretty successful. The other thing is that we all have a responsibility to engage the whole world. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, like internet technology is, uh, you know, um, it, it's it's not worked on as uniformly around the world as one might perhaps hope. So, um, I mean, like in 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 my, in my country, uh, in, in Finland, we we do we have a lot of industry in this this field, but it's not true of all countries in Europe, for instance, and certainly not true of. Uh, um, of the whole world, so it, it's somewhat centralized, but um, we have a duty to reach out to the different people working on this topic around the world, um, and we've been doing that this by, again, with another Isaac program where we pull in individuals from different countries, developing nations, for instance, and uh, also going out of our way to meet in new places. We're planning a meeting in South Africa, uh, South America, for instance. The other thing that I wanted to uh, mention was um, Anders Piazza raised the, the Montevideo statement and, and asked about the oversight roles, and there's been a couple of other comments on that as well. Uh, I think Ambassador Sepulveda had, had it right when he said earlier that um, the multi-stakeholder system is evolving. That is indeed right. Um, just to give you one example, um, at the ITF, we depend very much on, on, on the IANA function to do what we call protocol parameter registry function, and that is basically right, registering port numbers that have been allocated for a particular purpose. As, you know, a long time ago has been set up as a sort of U.S. government contract type of operation in, and run by ICANN. Um, and, um, you know, after after that set up, the communities, ICANN and ITF and IAB and so forth, have actually built quite a lot of machinery around this and, and policies and, and processes um, so we have signed agreements, we have um, set service level agreements, we have lots of tooling, we have tracking systems, we have oversight bodies. Um, and so I, I think that's one example of the evolution, and if there's any further evolution, I certainly hope there will be. Um, it's probably in the form of you know, trusting the models that have been created and you know, moving from a one country model perhaps to to the models that, that, that we ha- now have and actually are running the thing on a daily basis. And uh, then finally, I had, I mean, people were asking about the way forward. So, so my three conclusions are basically that, that we need to be continue connecting the people that have a need to talk to each other, the governments and, and various other organizations. And it's a two-way conversation. It's not government telling someone else, go do this or the other way around. It's a two-way conversation. We need the information from the governments, and and, and they, they have a need to tell us some things as well. Um, secondly, we need to continue the evolution of the different parts of the overall system for internet governance. And, um, and then finally, I think all of these forums and, and processes and discussions, they just need to be multi-stakeholder, no question about it. We should not even debate that situation where it would be some some party that's only in charge um, and and would not allow others to speak. The internet is, is for the whole world and there's many, many players that have a need to say something when when uh, things happen. And uh, if, if, if it's not possible to discuss between those different parties, then it's not really, really working. So, so I see that, that we all actually agree on this and, and the multi-stakeholder model is, is what we are doing and, and the rest it's just details. Thank you. Thank you. Virat, please. Thank you, Marcus. I'll try and um, attempt 
two or three points that were made. First, um, the issue of equal footing. Um, I'm going to draw one example here, which is the point that was made um, first off, which is the government's responsibility to build infrastructure and just illustrate how equal footing would work in that one case. Um, it would begin ideally with the government realizing that uh, this is one area where private sector investment can be brought in and that the government funds should be diverted to areas where private sector funding would not be available, such as primary education, rural health, uh, rural infrastructure, roads, and other areas which don't make for a good business case and will not um, allow for private investment. Once that realization comes into the policy and the fact that there is shortage of government funding available, then you would be expected to write policies that would allow for private investment with an appropriate level of foreign direct investment, whatever is suitable for that country. That would then be followed by writing actual legislation, laws, whatever is required to provide investor confidence and an environment in which investors can make that investment. Um, once such, a, such steps have been taken, then it would become, the scene would shift to the private sector, who would bring in the capital, who would bring in the infrastructure, who would start putting out the switches, the fiber, um, start the spectrum, and the process would begin. Um, the government would be required to build up a, let's say, an a independent regulator so that such capacity would be available and you could start removing some of the important functions out of government, which would be traditionally an operator in the telecom sector. Um, at this time, the civil society would have an important role because they would determine and help the government with which are the areas that are underserved. Are there business cases that are not working in broadband connectivity for rural parts of a specific country? What kind of programs can be rolled out on education, on e-health, uh, on basic grassroots level empowerment using the infrastructure that the private sector hopefully builds out? The technical communities would come in with their role, which is how can we stretch the spectrum to the maximum? What are the new innovations that are possible on sides of technology that will help empower people, women, the underprivileged? Um, this will also have a role for the academia, a very important role, which is in many cases lead committees which will have these discussions, write out papers which would project what the future of the investment should be, uh, put out case studies of what worked and what didn't work in the past, do research across the world and provide information in the infrastructure building process of what's happened. So I'm just, you know, we can go on and on, but you can see that each of the multi-stakeholder um, participants that has been identified under the Tunis agenda actually has a role in equal footing under just one piece, which is building infrastructure. You could then take this to the four other pieces that were mentioned, legal framework, uh, defending free speech, etc., and you know, we can go on. But I think uh, the youth, for example, you would think, what would they do? So they are the consumers of tomorrow. They are telling you what kind of services they need, what kind of educational and knowledge-related capacity is required in that network to stretch the network to help meet the needs of the 21st century. So this is just one example of equal footing as we see it from the private sector. It doesn't stop the role from the government from beginning to the end. It doesn't stop the roles from the private sector from the beginning to the end. And all the roles keep evolving, but everybody does what they are supposed to do to bring this infrastructure puzzle built out. Let's remind ourselves that 2.7 billion people across the world, or approximately 40% of the world population, is online today. Only 16% of the Asian population, that continent that we are currently in and hold this IGF at, is online. So there's a long way to go. On where we go from here, that's what our objectives are. That's what our sort of plans would have to be. Um, I also want to bring in a little bit about um, what the governments can do to strengthen the multi-stakeholder processes. Um, I refer India here, I think there are fellowships being offered to, um, I'm not sure what the numbers are, for 
young people to travel to events like this. I think it's two international events and two domestic events related to Internet governance. I can be corrected. There are several people who are involved with that. So they are instituting fellowships based on government and private sector funding that are sitting there to uh, expose more people to this entire dialogue that is currently on. I think uh, it's, an, it's an excellent program. Um, people have traveled on that program to this IGF and will to the future IGFs. Then there are areas of uh, new technology. For example, the one piece that we haven't built a lot on is mobile Internet so far as a discussion or M2M, which is a huge area of discussion and build up. So I think that's something that the governments are now opening up. I'll just close by saying that for 2014 and 15 are crucial years. Let's just keep our hearts and minds open. Uh, let's not decide too early on which way to go. I think this will evolve if we lend ourselves to this open consultative process of this kind and all the other meetings that have been mentioned that will occur during 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador. Thank you, sir. I, I don't want to uh, take up too much time so that we can return to the audience and, and our colleagues can finish speaking. I just I want to make one point, however, about the WISIS process. Uh, we are now looking at a WISIS uh, plus 10 review. The CSTD is in the process of conducting a holistic review of seeing where the action lines, where we are relative to the action lines as an international community. And I think two things need to happen. One, we need to finish that review. We need to assess if there's further work that needs to be done on the existing action lines. And then we need to uh, assess how we can move forward to ensure that we achieve the completion of those tasks that have already been set before us. I, I think it would be both premature in the sense that the 10 years have not been completed, neither has the review, to talk about either uh, conducting some sort of new WISIS or instituting some sort of new action lines. Um, we're not yet, that, that is not a discussion that is ripe uh, in our minds. But again, if, if there are others with different points of view, we, we would welcome hearing those. Uh, but we will, be, conduct, we will have, be having that discussion over the, the next year. There will also be the question of the extension of the IGF mandate and I hope the mandate will be extended because I feel we do need this kind of platform. Shall we go to the end of the table? Ambassador Fonseca. Thank you. I would, uh, as a final comment, uh, reiterate that uh, Brazil sees uh, the multi-stakeholder model and IGF, which is a maybe the best expression of the multi-stakeholder model at the international arena as a very uh, important place that serves as a meeting point for ideas, for contacts among different stakeholders, and for cross-fertilization of ideas and efforts. Uh, we are convinced uh, that the quality of decisions and the, the legitimacy of, of initiatives is further reinforced to the extent that stakeholders engage. Government, civil society, private sectors, all the stakeholders as recognized by the Tunis agenda. So we value the, the multi-stakeholder format, IGF, and indeed Brazil has put forward its candidacy to host uh, IGF in 2015. Uh, I was thinking that I would like to propose uh, uh, an acronym for this exercise, and I would uh, suggest ICT, in which I would stand for information. It's important, and it has been highlighted by some parties, the importance that each stakeholder, each group of stakeholders would be appraised of what others are doing, and this is maybe a, a starting point for the second letter of the acronym, which is C, that is for cooperation, to identify opportunities for cooperation and to make sure that all the concerns are addressed within this context. And the final letter would uh, stand for trust. The, this exercise can only hold if there is trust, if there is mutual recognition and mutual acceptance of stakeholders. Uh, on the part of governments, on the part of other stakeholders, it implies a change in cultures. We, are, we must recognize there are different cultures. Uh, government usually manage things in a certain way. Civil society has 
also a way of dealing. So we are talking about a collective endeavor. So it requires new ways of thinking, new creative ways of thinking. And in that sense, the session that focus on the role of governments, and we are very pleased to be, to be part of the discussion. We think we had a very uh, high-level discussion. And uh, from the perspective of government, it is sometimes even uh, strange to see people say, oh, we don't think there is any role. Or, but I'm, I'm glad to see that this is evolving, and it was acknowledged by participants even from the panel. Since from the point of view of government, some roles have a clear uh, demand for government action. I would give two examples. In Brazil, we have, as you know, uh, an area that accounts for roughly half of the country in the Amazon. So it requires clearly uh, uh, government in cooperation with all other stakeholders, but it requires policy to be uh, to, to be to address the situation in which we can make sure that the Amazon is connected, that remote communities uh, are, are connected. This is something that will not be dealt with uniquely by the private sector, the civil society. So the government has a clear role in that. And if we can also think in areas like defense, it's also a clear area for, for government in regard to cybersecurity. So uh, I think the beauty of the exercise is this, to identify areas in which working the multi-stakeholder model, uh, the, the mix and the intensity of cooperation will differ. Uh, and I, and I, this should be acknowledged by government, uh, but also acknowledged by the other uh, parties. Uh, I would also briefly refer to the summit that will be held in Brazil, and I want also to take note of the uh, uh, concern of other parties in regard on how this would relate to existing processes, and I just want to make it clear that Brazil is respectful of the existing processes. Actually, we have been active participants in all those processes, uh, and we certainly would not like our events in Brazil to compete or to overlap with any of these uh, uh, important meetings take pla taking place. The Shamil Sheikh meeting, of course, is a very important process. Uh, the CSTD meeting that we will receive the report from the Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation is also a very important process. So we think this should be as we plan for our event, we'll make sure this will not be uh, touched upon. But referring to all these processes, in our view, it, there is a clear need for a high-level review event, standalone event, either in 2015 or late 2014, to collect all those inputs that are being generated. The Sharm El Sheikh meeting will produce some very interesting outputs, as Ambassador Sepulveda was saying, but also the working group on enhanced cooperation. We expect it also to produce some very important ideas. Uh, we have been discussing on the, the, the meaning of equal footing, what are the areas that government should uh, engage into this. Uh, uh, so I think the enhanced cooperation will wishfully provide some ideas on how to proceed in that. And, uh, and this will take place uh, later on. Our meeting will take place later on, and there are many important inputs being produced. So we clearly see the need for uh, a high-level, multi-stakeholder uh, event that will collect those inputs and make some decisions. We are not envisioning to reinterpret it or to redraft the Tunis agenda. We don't think this is a, a good way or wise way to proceed, but we think that adjustments or some decisions taken by an authoritative body, multi-stakeholder body, might be, might be necessary as a result of this. I think it would be a pity if we lose the opportunity as we uh, complete 10 years of uh, the, the Tunis summit, not to engage in an in-depth uh, exercise that would go beyond a more bureaucratic review of action lines. So this is the, the, the position we are, we are taking this. 
And finally, just to thank you and the, the, um, our partners, uh, my colleagues in, in the table for a very high-level discussion, for very active participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister Vasey. Thank you very much, Chairman. I had the first word, and now you've given me the last word. We have three minutes left of this session, so I will be brief. Um, yes, I think the IGF needs to raise its presence. Uh, the speaker from the floor who started off the last round of questions uh, made, I think, a very valid point that a lot of countries do uh, think uh, have a sort of default position of thinking about the ITU. The ITU has been around a lot longer than the IGF, so it's important that we think about how we promote the IGF's activities around the world, and that's something that the UK government wants to participate in, and it's uh, very important. Um, and it's also, I think, important that um, at the end of IGF summits, uh, not necessarily policy proposals, but some sense of uh, the mood consensus, the themes emerges that people can take away from the IGF. So I think there is work to be done there. Uh, but we supported some of the changes to this year's IGF, which have made it uh, the best ever. So uh, it continues to evolve and continues to play, obviously, an absolutely vital role in uh, Internet governance discussions. Um, I very much support what Nigel Hickson said about the globalization of ICANN. I think that's a very important uh, steps being taken by ICANN uh, to have a presence uh, around the world uh, so that people, I mean it's always been the case with ICANN but again it's a perception issue, it's very important that all countries feel uh, that ICANN is there for them that they can have a role in participating and have a dialogue with ICANN and I think physically moving ICANN around the world is uh, one way of doing that so I think that's very important I got slightly lost on the questions about uh, whether the government was on an equal footing with civil society or uh, uh, business. Uh, I couldn't quite understand the point people were trying to make. And I suppose that goes back to, swings around in my last 30 seconds to the WISIS review, WISIS plus 10. I mean, my view is if it, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. It seems to be working pretty well. Uh, clearly, there will be an analysis of where we are 10 years on uh, from Tunis. But broadly speaking, as I say again, and I sound like a crack record, uh, this multi-stakeholder model, this participatory model of government, business, and civil society, without people analyzing whether we're on an equal footing or not, uh, or over-analyzing whether we're on an equal footing or not, seems to work very well. It works extremely well for the UK. It works well for many nations for whom the internet is becoming fundamental to their economy and the functioning of their society uh, and it will I serve well other nations, developing nations uh, as they come on stream and that for me is uh, where we are but as well I think the focus now has to turn to developing nations uh, and to the billions that are going to come online in the next few years which is why I very much hope that everyone will be at the Indian government's reception on Thursday at 11 o'clock uh, to hear about their experiences because that is the next great challenge to absorb the next billion or two billion who are going to come online and change the internet once again. Thank you very much. Thank you and I would like to thank all the panelists. As one speaker from the floor said, we had an excellent discussion that heralds a significant tomorrow. I think we really reached a large areas of convergence in our discussions and I take a, a very strong notion of partnership among all stakeholders of trust and partnership and clearly also uh, convergence that we do need to increase the meaningful participation of developing countries in all the internet governance arrangements. Uh, I think we also had a first, I think it's the first time if not mistaken that the minister participates in a panel for three hours and actively engages. I know it's the nightmare usually of civil servants. They fear ministers with, um, don't have a script ahead. So thank you very much for this, for your active participation. My civil servants know my concentration levels. <laughs> so they were worried I wouldn't last the three hours. But it was such an interesting discussion that I decided to stay.
Thank you very much for this. I would also like to thank our remote moderator and our floor moderators, Matthew Shears and Janet Hoffman, and like to join me in giving a hand to all the panelists. It was really a good panel. Thank you. The, the meeting is adjourned, and we'll be all here this afternoon, 2.30, for the opening ceremony and the opening session. Thank you.